Hey everybody, this is Neil Pasricha, and welcome, or welcome back, to another chapter of three books. Yes, you are now live and listening to chapter 22 of our epic 333 long chapter quest to uncover and discuss the 1,000 most formative books in the world. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this quest? Because when you talk to people about books, you say, what do you read? What are you reading? They always say the same thing, which is like, oh, I saw this on the bestseller list, or this was at the front of the front of the bookstore. Someone told me to read. That's fine. But we only live a thousand months. And as George R. R. Martin wrote in Game of Thrones, a reader lives a thousand lives before he dies. The man who never reads lives only one. So the question is, in those thousand months, with those thousand lives, which thousand lives will you lead? How do you decide which worlds to enter into, which books to sink your mind into when you're traveling or when you're, when you're at home in bed before you turn off the light? It's an important decision and one that we don't take lightly here. That's why we've traveled all the way to Coral Gables for chapter nine to sit down with Dave Barry, famed humorous Pulitzer Prize winning Dave Barry, and talk to him about which three books most shaped his life. We then have gone all the way up to Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, where we've sat down with Ariel Bissett, one of the world's largest booktubers who's bringing in a whole new audience into book by sharing by sharing uh, books she's reviewed and loved on YouTube in a really, really positive and popular way. We've gone all the way down to Del Mar, California for chapter 17 with the one and only Emily McDowell of Emily McDowell Studios, talking about books like The Liar's Club by Mary Carr and The Book of Shrigley by David Shrigley. We've really expanded our minds. We've been expanding our minds and our horizons and our ideas. And isn't that what books are all about? And isn't that what philosophy is all about? That's my opening question for today. Who do you think of first when I say the word philosopher? Who comes to mind? Is it Aristotle or Plato? Is it Nietzsche? Is it Karl Marx? Well, if you were to ask me that today, I honestly think the first person that would come to mind for me is probably Tim Urban. First of all, the definition of philosophy or philosopher is really interesting. It is a person engaged in the study of fundamental nature, of the fundamental nature of knowledge, reality, and existence. And for me, no one in the world right now is doing this as well as Tim Urban. I mean, this guy just writes a blog, okay, just. But really, it's a lot more than that. He's one of the most interesting and big picture thinkers I've ever come across in my life. The blog is massively popular. It's called waitbutwhy.com. Fast Company says, Tim has captured a level of reader engagement new media giants would be envious of. He has over a, a million and a half people visiting the website every single month. His TED Talk has almost 30 million views. I am obsessed with Tim Urban. I have exchanged emails with him now for years. I've seen him speak live at Summit LA, where in a beautiful moment that we're about to talk about in the show, he refused to get off the stage. Like the time was up and like he just wouldn't get off. And he was like taking a step down and people were laughing and cheering. And like, it was like this really uh, funny kind of moment. But like his intellectual curiosity is huge. It might be bigger than almost anybody I've met before. Wait till you hear how this guy's mind works. It's just like a beautiful thing to observe because... He's brilliant, he's a genius, he's super smart, and he's super funny, and the most amazing thing is he distills everything down to basic, simple, and understandable language so people like me can actually follow. That's what made it so hard to select a word of the chapter, by the way, which you'll hear about later if you listen all the way to the end, where we had the end of the podcast club. We always pick out a fun word, and it was hard, because Tim, Tim uses a lot of really, really simple words to explain really, really big things. So. Where are we going for this one? Well, we are going down to the Lower East Side of Manhattan. We're going to one of Tim's favorite coffee shops called the Ludlow Supply Company. And so we're really in a coffee shop, okay? So you're going to hear a coffee shop. You're going to hear a loud, busy Manhattan coffee shop. For those of you that might not like loud, busy Manhattan coffee shops, I apologize because you're going to hear people talking on the phone. You're going to hear people squeezing past us. Like we were in a really, really tight quarters. Um, in retrospect, I don't know if it was a good place to have it. You can let me know, but basically it was loud. And so think of this like, like a couple hour chat with your brilliant, smart, and funny friend, Tim, in a coffee shop, because that's exactly what it's going to feel like and sound like. Um, there's going to be like some techno kind of in the background at parts. Uh, if, if you're, if you're like listening to podcasts when you're running, this one might be a good one to run to. Um, and what do we talk about? Well, 
We talk about so many themes. We talk about breaking convention, retaining curiosity, why you should let your kids wear shorts in the winter, what is the stitches versus band-aids rule, what's the difference between a cook and a chef, realistically and also metaphorically, and which one would you rather be, what's the difference, um, or sorry, how do we separate art from artists, what can we learn from bad Beatle songs, and of course, what are the incredible Tim Urban's three most formative books. I hope you enjoy. Let's go. Hey, Tim. Hey, Neil. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me here to this, uh, the Ludlow Coffee Supply, which on name alone isn't obviously a coffee shop, but it is a coffee shop. It is. Yes. It's, it's, they're just getting cute with their name. It's um, very much a little fancy coffee shop. And I got my I got my avocado toast. We're in kind of what neighborhood of New York is this? This is not quite Lower East Side, but it's like, you know, the there's the Lower East goes all the way down to, um, you know, uh, to to the river basically. Uh, a little bit, but yeah, yeah. The Lower East goes basically all the way down to the river, and the, there, there's like the kind of grimy, cooler Lower East, and this is like the 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 I don't know. It's like the the more um, uh, gentrified kind of. Uh, yuppier area, but it's um, it's still kind of cool because it's so it's it, this is like Ludlow and uh, between like Stanton and Houston we're on right now, and I love this whole area. I love all the the whole whole area east of here is really great, and then Nolita's in the west. So I yeah. do you write in this? Coffee I shop? do. I, I, I well, I write in this coffee shop sometimes. Um, I write in Ludlow House down the street all the time, um, and then uh, and then there's a few other places. Um, there's like a little Korean bakery that happens to be great to write in nearby. Uh, so I, I usually f find a few spots wherever I live and then I'll, I'll just alternate. I love that. I, uh, I'm always on the lookout for places that have both, both Wi-Fi and plugs and having both is, seems oh, yeah. to be a rare commodity. Yes. Why? Well, there's a few things you need. Wi-Fi, you need plugs. You need, there, you can't, you need a place that has seats reliably. Otherwise it's, you go somewhere and you're just standing there. That's not, that doesn't work. Um, you need, um, you need, Decent food or coffee. I mean, at least good coffee. Um, and the temperature has to be normal. Sometimes they're just freezing in these yeah. places or whatever. Um, the music can't be too annoying. The, the heck can't be too much, like, too loud with people. So there's a lot. There's a lot to make a little. <laughs> and I, that's why I always find a few places that really hit the spot. And then, uh, yeah, I just stick with them. Nassim Taleb, who wrote The Black Swan, has this um, suffix in the back of his paperback thing called Why I Do All This Walking. And it talks about how being stimulated by the urban tapestry of a city actually is the best thing ever for creativity and exposure to what he calls black swans are just like surprisingly delightful events, you know, these huge oh, yeah. things. So oh, I mean, if you just, it's amazing. I'll, I'll take a walk every day and not notice anything. And then one day I'll just decide to look as I walk to just observe actively. And, um, and I'll, um, yeah, I'll like just pause and look up at the buildings and the architecture. And then I'll like, pause on the street corner, just look at the sign and look at the playground and the kids. And it's unbelievable how much is going on on any block in New York City if you just pause and look. There's endless stuff to look at and to observe. And so I, I love, New York's the best place ever to do that. It's, it's <laughs> The best people watching. Especially, yeah, especially if you like, have ever done a tour of the area or something and you really know what's going on. There's always this incredible history in every building, basically. So many, if you look at these Things where it shows a building from, you know, the, the same street from 150 years ago. It, yeah. it often has the same exact building. So you realize that this isn't actually, it's an 1850 artifact, this building. It just looks like it's from today because we're used to it. Yeah, it's so true. I, I actually noticed on your Twitter feed, you had this picture of a group of kids that you said you walked by in Brooklyn that were all covering their faces and dressed as mimes. Uh, Did they, I get that right? They were they were dressed, no, they were dressed um, in, in their normal Hasidic clothes. Um, and they which were being, I just mistaken for mimes. Right, which is fair. <laughs> um, and, and, and they, um, they, they were, they were not into having their picture taken. As I learned, as I snapped the photo, um, their hands flew up to their faces and it turned out to be one of my favorite photos actually. So you didn't ask for picture permission. No, I, um, I just went and did it. There were no parents around. So you can just kind of take a picture of kids if no one's around because then what are they going to do? You know, that's how I see it. <laughs> Speaking of, uh, what are they going to do? I just, as we sat down, I showed you a video I had on my phone. It's kind of like when we met in person. I mean, 
we exchanged emails back to 2016 um, about just blogging and, and things like that. And then I met you for the first time at Summit LA last November when in a beautiful display of, of intellectual prowess, you refused to get off the stage at the end of your time slot, much to the delight of the audience, which kept cheering for you. And I just showed you the video of that. And I think you just said to me as we were waiting in line at Ludlow Coffee Supply, what's she going to do? Is she going to push me off the stage? So yeah, I, um, that was quite the, quite the little scene there. I, uh, I, I basically, I was really into this new topic that I was writing about and I, um, it was the first time I had talked about it and I had, so the first time you do a talk, you know, usually it's going to be, what's the talk? What's the talk? It's a talk on like the political culture in the U S basically. And, um, and, 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 and talk about what we think versus how we think, um, Sounds really simple, but it's actually something we're really, really bad at. Um, and, and you have to get really, you know, if you really want to talk about sensitive topics, especially political things, you know, you got to take a big zoom out to, um, you know, the whole history of constitutional democracy and why free speech is the what it is and why political parties are the way they are. It's why. hard to fit into a 40 minute time slot. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I, think, yeah, I think you actually gave me an hour or maybe, yeah, whatever it was, I was, um, about three quarters done when the time was supposed to be done. And a lot of times, and it just, sometimes talks are very, you know, if you're like at a corporate conference, it's clearly you can't go over there on a tight schedule. This seemed kind of chill. It was like, you know, just a bunch of like young people. I think some Sitting people, on the floor. Yeah, sitting on the floor. It was just kind of calm. And so usually uh, I'll give myself a little leeway to go a little over or whatever. Plus there was a, like supposed to be a Q and A. It ended up being in another room, so that was part of what I didn't understand was that because usually I'm like, oh, I'll just go eat into the Q and A. You know, that that's, that to me is extra time. Didn't didn't turn out that way. We needed to. I needed to go, as it turns out. But I really then my perfectionism kicked in, and I was like, oh, I have like the whole finish here. And uh, normally I would have like sped up some other part to make sure I got to the finish, but I hadn't. So I just um, yeah, I went. Um, I just kind of refused to get off because they were being nice about it. And that was the problem. They were being like smiling and being like, okay. Nah, nah, nah. And so then I just um, decided to take advantage of that. And I stayed until the end of the talk. Which, but I, like I said, to the, everyone's delight, people give you a huge standing ovation. What you see in the video, people are, keep cheering as you can keep take, taking baby steps off. At the very last day of the conference, I bumped into a guy named Toby, who is the CEO of, of a company called Shopify. And uh, I met him and I was chatting with him. I said, what was your favorite talk of the whole conference? And he talked at length about your talk. So oh, even though it feels to you like you overstepped, you didn't, it was, it was delightful. So um, that's a little bit of context on like kind of how we know each other a little bit uh, through the online world and, and in person and, the, and where we are. So we're sitting at the back by the bathrooms. We're both in these cool trendy like wooden chairs that look like they were ripped out of a 1910 sort of a hockey arena. And you have a huge glass window behind you, which goes into some sort of boardroom with cool neon signs. I I think the like trip hop playing in the background won't be too loud on the recording. So we're going to dive in, if you're good with it, Let's do into it. your three most formative books. Book number one for Tim Urban is The Stinky Cheese Man and Other Fairly Stupid Tales by John Cheska, who was born in Flint, Michigan in 1954. This book was published in 1992 by Viking Books for the librarians. File it under E in the Dewey Decimal System for easy fiction for children up to age eight. This is a postmodern children's book. You don't hear that phrase too often. Full of twisted fairy tale parodies, breaking every convention possible. Talking to the reader, jarringly sad endings, the table of contents falling over to crush a character, listing stories in the table of contents that don't actually appear in the book, characters complaining about their screen time and it's just twisted like for example in the other frog prince the frog tells the princess he will turn into a prince if she kisses him so she does and then he says just kidding and hops back in the lake in the really ugly duckling uh, a parody of course of the ugly duckling he just grows up to be a really ugly duck not a swan and finally the namesake stinky cheese man is a parody of the gingerbread man a fun character that runs around asking everyone to catch him and no one wants to because he stinks. Tell us about your relationship, Tim, with the stinky cheese man and other fairly stupid tales by John Sheska. Yeah, I was very pleased with myself when I was you know, brainstorming which, which were the best books to, to do for this. And, um, and I remembered this one because I, I was really trying to think about books that influenced me. And the reason that, and the truth is I don't remember a lot of the details. Um, when I came up with this idea, I, it wasn't that it wasn't the specific stories necessarily. I remember liking it. I was, I think, fifth grade. I think I was fifth grade when I when I get, came across this book, and I remember loving the book. 
in fifth grade. But the thing that has, because there's a lot of books I liked in fifth grade that I clearly don't remember today, especially books that aren't, you know, on my shelf or what weren't like family favorites. This was a book that I think I found in the elementary school library, read once, and then never even like came across again. So what was interesting to me is that I remembered it so distinctly. And I realized, is I, I think I remember it so distinctly because it was so unconventional. It just, it just threw away every convention every chance it got. So it's like you said, they had table of contents, things that weren't there. The table of contents itself, all the words are slanty. Um, there's, um, on the back of the book, there's this, um, so they have the little ISBN yeah. uh, scanner thing, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. And there's this, this chicken of some kind. There's a hen who's looking at the ISBN thing and, and she's pissed. She doesn't like it. She's, she thinks it's really stupid and annoying. And like, she says like, um, and she's also pissed that she's only in three of the pages of the book. <laughs> so she's complaining about that. And she's just saying it's like ugly, the ISBN, and she doesn't want it there. And she says, who would buy this book anyway? I was just thrilled when I, I was just like, this is the best, this, can I swear? Yeah. I was like, this is the yeah. best shit ever. And, um, <laughs> and I was like, so, and, and so what I would say is like, um, uh, I, I'm realizing that it was like the first time I came across like the ability, I'm like, you don't have to just like do things the normal way when you're like, if you're creating something, you can just kind of do it the way you want. And it would go over well, at least with some people. Cause I think I would have before that said, you can't just do that either. Cause you're just not allowed to, or you're, um, if you do something like that, then no one will buy parents won't like buy that for their kids. And then I just like, it hit me that that's not how the world works. And that everyone's kind of like delighted by things that are different. And no one, and very often, like no one would think to do that. And so I, I think I like, I've tried to like, that somehow like influenced me in a way because I think I am um, like today consistently try to remember that lesson. Like I try to, if something doesn't need to be a normal thing, the normal way, um, it's often really um, a great move to not do it that way, even though, but, but you have to override your, so the, what would happen here is you, you would say, well, no one else does that. So there must be a good reason. And the truth is often there's not a good reason. And if you can realize that and pick out the times when it's actually not a good reason that other people don't do something and then you do it, it's like this great reward you get. Everyone is notices your stuff and everyone really likes it and they're surprised and delighted by that. And it's hard to get surprised and delight, but it's actually not that hard if you just think about the areas where you can do something different where no one's quite thinking to do it. Beautiful, because as, as you said, you know, it's not, some people say different is better than better. And there's a lot of rule breaking uh, as we're both talking about in, in this book, um, you are a Harvard-educated guy writing 30,000-word blog posts with stick figures, swearing, crazy examples with octopuses and instant gratification monkeys. So I think it's fair to say, like, in a way, you, you break a lot of rules, too. Um, how do you think about rules? Like, how do you think about, how, you said, if you can see the rules, how do we see rules? Um, well, how do we know which rules we can break? What, what are some rules that writers follow today that everyone's just mindlessly following that, that yeah. we don't need to. How do we think about rules that those invisible barriers in our lives that you're talking about? Um, so I think, um, cause you have to think like, you no, know, there's, there's of course there's legal rules, right? So like plagiarism is not, is, is a rule for a good reason. Um, there's also like rules that involve integrity and not plagiarism is an example of that too. Like there's certain things that- but There's sampling. Yeah, well, there, there's, right, there, but there's certain things that, like, um, that people don't do, uh, people who you respect don't do, and there's a really good reason why, right? Um, or, um, you know, sometimes, um, I don't know, there's, um, there, there's just a lot of, like, you know, things that you find that if you do, if you break a rule, you find that afterwards that there's a good reason why people don't break that rule, and, and, and uh, that, 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 that it's kind of, it's born of wisdom, that rule, and the wisdom still applies today. It happens to be the wisdom when that was built, whenever that wisdom was kind of conceived, the world hasn't changed that much, or people haven't changed that much, the industry hasn't changed that much, and so it still holds, and, that, and then that wisdom is wise. Um, but if you, uh, but then a lot of other times, there's something that either was some famous writer started this tradition a long time ago and everyone started copying him or her, or there was, um, there was a situation where the world was very different at a certain time, yeah. and it really made sense then to do things a certain way. Um, and uh, and then today the world's changed, and it and and but no one quite has thought about it. And no, it's it's it takes all it takes is kind of re-examining norms, 
with a different lens on. With instead of um, you know, there's this concept of reasoning from first principles yeah. um, versus reasoning by analogy, and 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 really what that means is. Um, uh, you know, reasoning from first principles is just looking at things kind of with fresh eyes, trying to, as if you're an alien who's never seen it before and being like, well, what makes sense here? What could we do here? What, what should be here? Um, reasoning by analogy is just saying, well, what's normal to do here and then doing it, right? What, 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 you know, and then, and then if, if, if you have an idea, a new idea, and you say, well, no one else has done it, there must be a good reason, right? That's reasoning by analogy. Most of the time, that's really, um, it's a shortcut that our brains are very, we're very lucky that they do that. Um, you don't, you can't reinvent the wheel every single time you do anything. You can't, you know, go deep with what shoes you want to wear necessarily. Some people do, but I don't. You, you know, I, I just try to buy shoes that seem normal and that's fine. You can't like, you know, you, 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 you can't go deep with everything, right? So you have to, for the most part, you're going to be kind of copying society and that's okay. You shouldn't feel bad about that. That's like, but then there's, then there's other times that really matter to kind of reason from first principles for me being in my, in my creative work in my like actual writing, that's a good time to try to do it when you can. So it's, it's a habit. It's trying to develop a habit of questioning a norm before you kind of copy it. Again, a lot of times the answer to that norm is going to be, yeah, that's there for a good reason. Other times, you, you you might have a hypothesis that it's not, and then you can test it, and you're going to get burned sometimes. You're going to go outside the norm; people are going to hate it, or um, it's going to you're going to you're going to realize later why there, the norm was there. Okay, that's fine; that's a risk you have to be willing to take. And then sometimes you'll actually break a norm in a way that everyone is delighted by, and people will suddenly forward your shit everywhere because they're super <laughs> excited. They're just, it delighted them because it was something totally new and fresh. Yeah. Like like the stinky cheese man. In my case, like the stinky cheese man, yeah. I would have forwarded that all over if I could have back in when I well, was in fifth grade. But even just looking it up today, at where it is on online, you know, it's tons of reviews, very well ranked, still selling like crazy. You know, it's it's done extremely well. This is a kids book written. You know, it's kind of a parody ago. for kids. You know, it's yeah. uh it's um, it's it's a parody of all these other genres, but it really hits the fifth. You know, the part of I'm always and uh, I, you know, I always admire people who do um. You know, children's books well because you have to really tap into the inner sense of humor of a fifth grader for example that's hard you know maybe having a fifth grader helps but um yeah they really did it well so I, yeah well I'm, I'm thinking of another kids book that came out a couple years ago by bj novak i don't know if you know it called the book with no pictures i actually um i heard about it and i really want to read it i i, I think bj is great and i um i haven't read the book though. so it's got no pictures in it for those that don't know and then he just says like the, the rule of this book is whatever the guy who reading it says, the other person has to say. And he's like, he's like I'm a bubble butt monkey. What? No, I'm not. And so the kids just start laughing. I mean, it probably was really easy yeah. to, to write and produce this book. It's just text on a few pages. But I sold astronomically well because, as you say, it broke it broke rules and, and it, it showed up differently. And kids like that. Kids, I think kids have an instinct, actually, to reason from first principles more than, than you. We get trained out of it. You know, like... Um, um, kids um often um they ask to play the why game yeah which is them you know you give them a conclusion um you know go do this or you have to do this and then what they're doing is they're trying to break down how that conclusion was built what were the first principles that built that so they're going to say why 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 which is them trying to kind of dig underneath the surface to get to the bottom to say okay now i get it and parents get annoyed with this and you're quickly and teachers get really annoyed with it and you're pretty quickly trained don't um you know don't don't hurt yourself reasoning, just obey. You know, we, we are taught that very quickly. Um, so I think, I think if anything, a, a kids can appreciate it a lot of times um, in a way that maybe it's harder for adults to. Well, how do we retain that? You, you've retained that in a sense that your, your work is full of curiosity. You've called yourself many times a very curious person and, and, and it's clear in, in your writing that, that you are very curious. Um, what do we do? I have little kids. Uh, how do I keep them curious uh what can and was anything done to you as you grew up that kept you curious that way or do you see other people doing that well as parents um i think um now parents are very hands-off which is some and i was also an only child till i was five so i think that gives you a lot of time to just kind of you're just I like kind that of phrase only child till i was five i'm gonna start using that i was my, an only I, child till i was two my fiance is an actual only child and she says it's like cultural appropriation to pretend to be an only child she gets very mad at me and she says <laughs> i'm like she says it's not all fair that i get to call myself that because it's not because it's not true but anyway <laughs> depends how long your ellipsis is in the middle of that I sentence think five years <laughs> is a lot you're very formed by five um and i i think that like the key today I think is first of all, just 
awareness of this concept, just thinking about this concept, reasoning from first principles versus reasoning by analogy, um, and just just getting that in your head and realizing that um, that the world is. This is a, this Steve Jobs kind of quote. He said something like, "The world, you know, you you it's this epiphany you're gonna have when you realize the world is." only was that you see around you was built by people no smarter than you. And they often were just trying something and it's stuck because people just, and everyone starts copying it when it works and that um, you can go and change that. You can just go and And so I think it's absorbing. Say, these are, these are, you know, these kind of quotes that sound cliche, but if you can really absorb it and continue to remind yourself, eventually it can become a habit to look at a lot of things through that lens and just have a habit where you kind of are not respecting conventional wisdom that much. You're not, you know, you're not giving it the credence um, that it often gets. You're kind of just assuming it's going to be kind of dumb. A lot, a lot of things. The conventional wisdom is going to be wrong and outdated yeah. and about a bunch of stuff. So I think that um, I hear you at the high yeah. level, but are are you ta do you ta and by the way, being that this is in the coffee shop in the Lower East Side in Manhattan. I want to just say to everyone listening, you'll hear conversations in the background, people opening and closing doors. That's just part of our aura and our, our uh, as Seth Godin would call it, patina on this particular chapter of the show. So thank you for, for listening along with us. But Tim, I was going to say, I get you at a high level on that. But what about tactically? Are you one of the people that says, like, schools kill creativity? Or, like, you know, we get formed, like, you know, like the industrial, you know, like cows going into the front door and out the back door. Tactically, do you think, and I know you're a big traveler, are you, is there things that you, you would particularly do when or if you you had yeah. children like that you would do to yeah I'm thinking kids. about this because I plan to have children but I don't have them yet um I think well first of all so I I um I heard Neil deGrasse Tyson once talk about um how we don't let kids be kids and it's actually really important and I, and, and so this is an interesting little anecdote he was talking about just you know, you'll see a kid with an egg and they're like throwing it tossing it up and catching it whatever and what do every parent do they jump up and say stop that put that back you know and he's saying, what they're doing is they're testing a bunch of stuff. They're testing physics, right? They're, 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 they're seeing how, and then when they drop it, they're going to they're gonna see a whole splat. They're going to learn something, right? And they'll learn a lesson. And, and, it, and it's like, it's really, of course, if you're your parent, you're like, well, we, I was going to make that egg, and um, it's also going to be a mess, and you're not going to clean it up well, and this, this whole thing sucks. But it's just interesting kind of like letting kids kind of just like be a little bit wild and mess up with a bunch of stuff. Um, and... Um, you know, like, well, there's there's a few different principles here. There's another principle, which is just like, rather than be like, wear your coat, wear your coat, it's cold. You know, I think that the better thing is to say, oh, if you want to wear shorts in the winter, all right. And then you're out all day and the kid's cold. And you're like, yeah, well, you know, you mean, <laughs> let's see what you do Maybe next, next time. time. Next time you probably should. And then that kid's going to just like grow up like an adult more, I think. You know, I, I was always told I had to get in bed at 8 p.m., you know, when I was like seven or eight. And I hated it. It was my least favorite thing. And I still hate going to bed. And I like waking up because I like being awake because awake is interesting and sleep is boring. Um, and I hated though being told to go to bed. And I feel like some kind of like resistance against authority in that situation stuck. And now I always stay up too late. And it's hugely self-defeating. And it's a terrible, terrible thing. And I feel like if, if my parents had just been like, um, you, know, you know, maybe it's harder than this because maybe the kid will just do it every night. And then you're just like, wow, my kid is getting sick. And But I just feel like, you know, if the kid can stay up late one night and then feels horrible the next day and you're like, oh, yeah. And then you just as almost like a friend, you're like. You're like, oh, yeah, I, I, I've done that a few times. It's like, it's bad, isn't it? And then the kid's like, yeah, it's bad. And then they don't want to do it anymore. So this is a different point a little bit. No, but it, I like it. It ties in a little bit to um, the same idea, which is that when, you know, when kids are playing the why game, to, like, in, to understand what they're doing. And they're trying to understand the first principles of the idea. And to, you know, sometimes they're just trying to annoy you. But usually they're actually trying to dig into how something was built. So they can understand how reasoning is built in general. So they can be a reasoner. If you just say, just listen, just obey, then what are you doing? You're, you're, you're actually... The, the, you're, you're, they're going to kill their confidence as a reasoner. They're going to think, well, I, I, I was always told not to reason. No, I, I just, just trust authority. They know better than I do. So instead of um, trusting their own reasoning, uh, they end up um, and losing all skill of reasoning. And they, yeah, they lose all their confidence yeah. in, in their own reasoning where they, um, they, they, they start to believe that uh, they, they, then they just become adults. And when the conventional wisdom says something, you know, you should do this, or people should get married by this age, or, um, you know, it's, you should, you should sleep, oh, go to sleep and wake up at this time. No self is in the customs line. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that one's different because that, that, that one's, I mean, I actually think that you can push legal rules like that when they're kind of stupid. Um, if no one's going to catch you. no cell phones on, on an airplane. Right. Now they've taken that away. But there's a distinct difference. Yeah. So you have to learn how to have a good filter because you can break, you can easily break a rule like this. Okay. You can break a rule by cutting lines. You can't. 
but it's a shitty thing to do and you shouldn't do it. And it's, and it's, and, it, and it's one of those things where it makes you a sh like, um, if it, this is a cliche thing, but if everyone did it, it, things would suck. That's a really important lesson. So you don't all, you break all rules, right? And you also don't want to get into legal trouble, right? And you don't want to like cheat on your spouse. Like, so because then you're betraying someone, right? And legal trouble, you're, you're going to, there's serious, serious consequences. So you have to have some, it's, I guess integrity comes first, then rule breaking. So integrity can say, I'm not going to cut lines because that's a shitty thing to do. And if everyone did it, then the world would suck. And we wouldn't be able to have this nice society if everyone acted like that. Um, and then you can say, um, I'm not going to like be unfaithful uh, or lie to my friends or whatever, because that's betraying something that's sacred. That's betraying trust, right? So that's an integrity thing. And rules are, those rules are more important than anything. Then you go down a level and you say, now for a lot of other stuff, like your cell phone in the customs line, it doesn't matter. I use my cell phone on the airplane. I do not believe that. If, if, if the cell phone could crash the airplane, they would not let you have cell phones on a plane, obviously. Clearly, it's like something where just, it's like if 50 people were doing it, it, there would be some kind of interference with like the signal and it would be like much more annoying to, or something. I don't more know what it is. on the over, yeah, over, over. Just I have totally rejected that rule. And the only reason, the only reason I get self-conscious about doing it is if I feel like people around me are seeing it and it feels like I'm being disrespectful to that. But if I think no one can see me, I'm clearly going to just continue to text until the plane takes off. So the, the, this is, I'm t those are just kind of like practical, yeah. great rule breaking. I'm, you know, I'm talking about, um, you know, the, the big decisions you make in your life, the way you want to create your career, the way you want to, where you want to live, the kind of person you want to marry, if you want to marry someone, um, and how you want to run your relationship and how you want to work on it, how you want to raise your kids. And then for me, it's like creative decisions, you know, how I want to, um, um, you know, present information online and, and, and what format and how do I want to talk to readers and how do I want to support myself with this? Most of that has a lot of room for, especially since the world's changing so quickly for like, okay, well, what's true? You know, maybe 10 years ago, some of this stuff is true. What's true today? And you find that a lot of it is not based on anything. And you suddenly seem like this leader and this original, if you just are thinking, using that child reasoning that you've been trained out of, if you go back to it, it, it often will set you way apart from the pack just by using the child reasoning that's somewhere buried in there. Yeah. yeah. I love that. I, I hear so many things to jump off of from there. One, one that you made me think of, is on children and letting them, you know, that sort of cliche, provocative parenting challenge of if you find a cigarette, make them smoke the whole, smoke the whole pack. Or if they start drinking, like, make them, like, feel the pain of it. A, a buddy of mine named Joey Coleman, uh, who's, who's a great uh, uh, author living in Denver, you know, he has this phrase for his kids. He's got two boys, I think four and two years old, if I'm getting it right. He has stitches versus bandages as a rule. Anything causing bandages is fine. Anything causes stitches, he interrupts as a parent. He says as they get older, say they're teenagers, that rule's going to change to I love that rule. There you go. So many parents say no stitches or bandages. Right. And as he, and, and I was like, oh, how's that rule evolve? He's like, well, when they're teenagers, I have a new rule. I've already planned it out. It's called stitches versus casts. Mm. When they're teenagers, stitches are fine. Casts are not allowed. And I, when I need to remember this. This is brilliant because it's like a kid, whatever the, okay, think about this. If a kid gets stitches when he's 15, think about the other 40 times, you know, he was doing something like that, didn't get stitches. Those are valuable, adventurous life experiences. And the time that he got stitches, learned something. And maybe, you know, once the stitches are in, laughing at himself about it. And it's like a fun, it ends up being a fond memory. And that's a great, I, that's a, I think that's a great, I, I skinned my knee badly falling down a hill. Basically, I was, I was on a little tricycle. I was like four or five. In your was, only child stage. In my only child <laughs> stage. And we were like in Cape Cod or something, and I was like going on a, right around. I went on this, you know, this like little side road, and I went down a street, and I fell off and skinned my knee. I remember it because it was a huge scab, like one of these giant scabs. Um, and like... That was a risk that my parents took that I would, by letting me just head out where I wanted to on this little bicycle, um, they were taking the risk that, they basically were in, almost ensuring that at some point this is going to happen. And I don't know whether they did this wisely or just, they just like without thinking about it, but either way, it was a trade-off they decided was worth worth making, was um, an eventual skin knee for basically this kid to have, advent, like, you know, cure. Curio you know, be able to like go and uh, indulge his curiosity all yeah. day by himself on his little thing if he wants to. Um, so I, I think that's awesome. I need to remember that. Yeah, well, it's it's. An what does it turn into as an adult? So st yeah. stitches are cast. Then what happens? Then he has a thing after that, which is called like you know, I think over eighteen, it's like you know, cast or death. 
or, or something like that, yeah, right? Yeah. It's I like, it's like all, really, if I an 18 year old's going to get on the back of the motorcycle, well, you have to decide if that's like, de- you know, that's right. Riding a decide. motorcycle really fast with no helmet. That's, 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 that's death. That's no, don't death. do that. So, so that's, that's right. Cut that off. But, but, but maybe like, you know, mountain biking, mm-hmm. mountain biking, which is pretty damn dangerous. Um, you know what? Go for it. You might find a lifelong passion and yeah, you might end up with a really badly broken wrist at some point. And that'll, that'll suck, but it's, it's not worth not mountain biking for. And the point is that, you know, you don't have to adopt this model. The point is just, as I'm hearing from you, Tim, is like come up with a model that allows for that growth and development to imbue that curiosity, which makes people read both interesting books and develop a life, which they're, they're leading and living from first principles more often than not. I'm 38 right. years old. You know what? I've had never had a broken bone. I've never had a stitch in my life. My parents are um, East Indian immigrants to Canada, very conservative, very safe. You I've know. never had a broken bone or stitch either. You haven't? So I'm like, I like, I wasn't, my friends were all like, go bike downtown in my suburban town. And I wasn't allowed because it's too far away and I didn't have the right helmets and knee pads and stuff. So I have, so I'm still working out of that now at age 38, like taking little risks. Yeah. When if I'd gotten out of my system at a young age, maybe I'd take more now. So it's a it's question mark. It might teach mark. you a little lesson about risk in general, you know, not if just I was physical still risk. Here. Huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I was still made it, if I made it. Right. <laughs> but I will say. Um, the most popular blog post I ever wrote on my blog was called Old Dangerous Playground Equipment because it went viral because everyone in the comments was like, no one has casts anymore. The kids are too weak. So yeah. it's a it's a big thing. And, yeah, I love and it. talking about childhood and upbringing is a nice, nice segue to your second book, Tim. If we can just transition a little bit. Thank you for your conversation about rules and curiosity there. We're going to go to your second book. And this book is called... I'm still working on my dramatic pause before titles. Uh, this book is called The Boy Who Reversed Himself by William Sleater. William Sleater lived from 1945 to 2011, and The Boy Who Reversed Himself, he wrote and published in 1986 by Puffin Books. Librarians, it's in the FIC or fiction category for people above age eight. It's a science fiction young adult novel that deals with exploration into other dimensions and provides a journey into the world beyond our own. Tiny, tiny, tiny summary of the plot, just for those people to get some context, everyone to get some context. When Laura finds her homework in her locker with its writing reversed, she's baffled until she learns an unbelievable secret. Her weird neighbor, Omar, has the ability to travel to the fourth dimension. Laura forces him to take her there, and then... Uh, as a novice in force space, she goes there on her own. There's only one problem. She doesn't know how to get back. So, Tim, tell us about your relationship with The Boy Who Reversed Himself by William Sleater. Yes. So, this was sixth grade. I was in a total reading craze. You know, this is when I read The Giver. And every, and I could have said The Giver here, but I feel like a lot of people read that book. And there was a few, you know. I don't know The Giver. Oh, wow. Okay. Put it on your list. It's a dystopian future book for, like, middle schoolers. And it's extremely good. Thank you. But anyway, I picked this one because I feel like it's very unfamous. Um, William Slater, he actually came and spoke to my elementary school in fifth grade. And I remembered his name, but, you know, he was a nice, seemed like a nice guy, whatever. But forgot about it. And then in sixth grade, my English teacher, I said I wanted to read, like, a good science fiction book. And my sixth grade teacher recommended that I uh, check out William Slater. And I was like, oh, that guy, oh, my God. He's like a real author. That's so cool. So I went into the library, got his book. And I don't remember which. It was called Among the Dolls, his first book. And I read it, and I was obsessed. And then I read Interstellar Pig, another one of his books, and I was obsessed. And then at some point, I read this book, The Boy Who Reversed Himself. And then I read The Green Futures of Tycho, which is about time travel. And I read um, um, one about, you know, um, like, I don't know, you know, uh, it was, it was something called, uh, something with a, was a in Vegas uh, hotel. There was someone behind the Vegas hotel where... Uh, where um, the there was like an alien landing at some point. Oh, okay. Um, it was. Uh, it I was, just flipped open the opening yeah. of the boy here reverse himself. Into the dream. Yeah, into the dream. into the dream. So you went through his oeuvre. I went. I, I went on a binge. Word. I binged. <laughs> they're short books. They're, but the thing is, they're just so. Um, they're so they're mind bending. And honestly, I think they would be mind bending today. But for a sixth grader who hadn't really been exposed to a lot of these concepts, I mean, and he just he just like really took me by the hand and like brought me on adventures, this author. Not a famous author. He was a, you know, minorly famous. But if you look on, you know, Amazon, these books have 27 reviews, 30 reviews. You know, they, they're they beloved by the people who read them. But it, I think he might have been local, you know, New England more and whatever it was. He never was a huge deal, but I think he should have been. I just, it was the first exposure to an awesome time travel book. You know, and this guy, this little kid, this is another book, um, but finds this, um, 
this little like orb, this sphere, and, 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 and he can change the dials on it and then it takes him to a different time. But it, he experimented with things like not just taking him back 30 years, like back to the future, which I loved also at the time um, or whatever, but also taking him like, um, you know, 10,000 years in the future. And he like gets there and sees this like unbelievably like terrifying, like totally different. He doesn't even know what it is. And he comes back. And that just was like, what a cool concept. What is this? What is New York City going to be in 10,000 years? Like it might be wilderness. It might be, you know, it, it might have, it might be this intensely advanced thing you can't imagine. It's, it's, it's really cool to think about. So, and then, so for this book, The Boy Reversed Himself, I basically had to pick one of the William Slater books. And I chose this one because it stuck with me, um, um, as much at least as any of the others. And it, this one's about dimensions, you know, the, what, t the idea of like, what is a fourth, what could a fourth dimension be? You know, some people say it's time. Can you stop and say, oh, okay. I was, I was just about to say, can you explain that for people, but you're well, about to? It, it, uh, it's like humans actually, it's like, um, if you're a two, it's like a, a picture I am, a little two dimensional world of little shapes, basically stick drawings that are all stuck on a sheet of paper. And you try to explain to them what like up and down is there's nothing they could do. They could say, oh, you mean like like up and down, they would like go up, you know, uh, right and left on their thing. No, 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 it's a different thing. They just couldn't get it. That's how we are with the fourth dimension. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's another cool thing I saw actually online, like a YouTube video where basically if you take a, um, if you take a three-dimensional shape, like a cube, and you see a shadow of it, it's two-dimensional. It's a two-dimensional shadow of a three-dimensional object, right? So the shadow of it's gonna be like, you know, it's gonna look like some kind of drawing of a three-dimensional object. Right. So this is a Carl Sagan YouTube, I think. And he says, so basically you can't see the fourth dimension, but you know what its shadow looks like, which is a three-dimensional cube is what the shadow of a fourth dimensional cube looks like. So that, again, it's, you can't really understand what that means, but at least you can kind of like play with the idea of another dimension. So in this book, the thing, one of the things that stuck with me that was cool was, so when the kid would go to the fourth dimension and come back, he would be like flipped. And what that means is his eye, his, is like he would look to everyone else how he looks in the, to himself in the mirror. He's like, he'd be flipped uh, laterally himself. along, yeah, al alongside his like, you know, the, the axis, his, um, whatever you'd call that, his axis that goes down the middle of his body, which for a human isn't a big deal. You, you, you know, his, you know, it's like when the girl did it in the book, his, her mom was like, you know, you, you, something looks weird. You look weird. Are you you okay? set the table the wrong way. Right, right. <laughs> but, but, she, but she was normal otherwise, but she just looked a little off. It was like, you know, but her face was reversed symmetrically. But then in the fourth dimension, they came across fourth dimensional creatures. And when they reversed themselves, it was as if your whole face was like inverted and they were like grotesque. And I don't know, there's just little things like that that I just thought were like, and then they came back and, they were, and, and, and their taste buds had basically inverted. So ketchup tasted like chocolate and made you drunk and other things. So I'm not selling this well, but the, the, the first, for a, a kid that age, and I really still think I would like these books, um, they're short and so I could fly through like 10 of them. So I basically absorbed like 10 sci-fi concepts in six months and it just like opened my imagination. It basically like, I think for a kid that age, um, in, gen in general, I think sci-fi is good for anyone because it, it just can basically create co like whole new rooms in your imagination that weren't there before. And suddenly like, it's just like, it just, yeah, I don't know. I think it's really good for your head. I definitely, have, you know, if I have kids, I'm gonna have them read a lot of science fiction. I'm going to find, you know, hopefully. And also, I also love the separately while we're here and that same round state at the same time. Those Judy Bloom books were awesome. Um, uh, Tales of a fourth grade, nothing, yeah. super fudge. The, I, the, 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 she also crushed it. Nice. They were just like books about being kids. Basically. Judy Bloom is also a guest on three books. Okay, there yeah, you go. Yeah, yeah. I went Very to her, her Key West bookstore. Um, but the other interesting thing, Tim, is that this book is dedicated to my brother. It says on the inside of the boy who reversed himself. The, this book is dedicated to my brother, Danny Slater, the noted computer scientist. He's given me imaginative ideas for many of my books, including this one. And the point is that I think you're making is that these books are all steeped in actual, true scientific ideas. And then they take off with a fictional tale from them. Absolutely. You know, and and I read this for the first time. I was occasionally lost, but he keeps, because it's written for children, he keeps ratcheting up the premises like slowly. So by the end of it, when you're there, you feel like you've gone a million miles from the beginning, but you've been taken by the hand really slowly and carefully. And it makes me think about accessibility, okay? Uh, you know, um, you write long, long blog posts that take very, very big concepts. Mm -hmm. Here's the fourth dimension distilled into a children's book. And you take the reader along sort of tastefully. Um, how do you think about accessibility in writing? And I guess my sub question there, and if we can get into it a little bit, is, you know, he's also distilled a huge concept into this tiny little kid's book beautifully. 
in this world of information overload, how do we think about doing that? Yeah. I think there's two things he does well that I try to do myself. Now that you say that, I'm realizing that. The first is, yeah, you take a super complex concept and you assume that everyone reading it is like, um, at least for me, I assume they're a smart, curious layman, which is how I consider myself before I start writing. Like, I'm really curious, but I'm a layman. And I've maybe little learned a little bit, but I wish I knew more. How do you define layman? Uh, layman for me is, you know, someone who, if you say knowledge can go from a one to a 10. So one is you never heard of the concept. And a 10, you're you know, one of the world leading experts. You know, nine, you have a PhD, you know, something like that. I try to, I, a layman for me is, my, I think most of my readers probably are, my targets are people who are like two and three. One, if you've never heard of it, you probably are not that curious about it. You probably just, it's something you, you haven't even like, you might, because you probably heard the word, but you never even thought to look it up or hasn't stuck with you. Now, that, sometimes I think I probably write about something that someone who's never heard of yeah. likes to post, but it's not when I'm, I'm targeting people, because I, all these concepts I've always heard of because I'm curious and I'm trying to, um, or usually, um, so, and I'm talking about concepts like AI, big concepts, yeah. you know, if there's something that's more obscure, I assume most of my readers have not heard of it, but you know, if someone has just had no idea what AI is, they probably don't care. So someone who's at a two or a three or maybe a four, yeah. these people have read a couple articles. They, they, they know the deal. They've seen the movies, you know, but they don't really understand why exactly how it works and what everyone's talking about, you know, or machine learning, you know, within that or cryptocurrency or, um, you know, colonizing Mars or virtual reality and what you know, the future of that. And uh, you can keep going CRISPR, you know, all these concepts. Uh, so you write for twos and threes. I basically- From a place, and I asked you to define layman. So you're saying- I was at a two or yeah. three maybe before I started, just say. So I was a layman, right? Me, me, meaning, I, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert. I'm not in, in this industry at all. I'm just a person who hears about it. And then my goal is to get to like a six as a researcher. So I'll research and learn, and it's surprisingly easy to get to a six on the internet. You, have, you know, you're, it's not, it takes some time, but you have all the tools you need. I'll read it, I can read a few books on iBooks just on my computer. I can just skim through them, and um, Wikipedia can get you right away to like a four. You know, I mean, it's just Wikipedia itself is a nice overview. You can't, you know, not everything in it's gonna be accurate, but it's pretty pretty good overview usually. At least teaches you about where the walls of the topic are. You know, where how, how, uh, how, how far they go and exactly what you don't know. You have to know what you don't know. Then I'll start filling in those holes and I'll get myself, you know, and, and, and so I read a lot of articles. I read, I'll just, I'll read a bunch of articles that are also for laymen, like Gizmodo articles. Again, n none of those are is, is itself is a reliable source, but together, if you read a bunch of this stuff, you start to get a real feel. Then I can go start getting to the harder stuff to get myself to, to a six. I'll read like journal articles to really dig into some of the, behind, you know, the science behind the scenes. This is the boring part, but it, it's, it helps me to get up to a place where I really can, what I want to be able to do is in a Q and A about this topic. Not just be able to answer most questions, but be able to, when they give a follow-up and say, but, but why? How does that work? I want to be able to answer that question. Now, an expert can go much, much further, and they can give you a whole course on how it works. And are you saying, if I'm following you here, because I'm, I'm doing the squinty head, head hurting thing, um, but are you saying that journal articles are there for written for people that are at like a level four? No. Journal articles are basically the expert world talking to each other, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and they're out there. They're and, like nines talking to each other. Yeah, they're nines talking to You're each other. You're just peeking in. And so what I do is I'll go, and the papers are boring and often I don't fully understand them. They're not intended to be entertaining. They're intended to be, you know, practical and get this point across in a crisp, you know, crisp, clear way to other experts, basically. And hopefully get me tenure. And yes, exactly. And get them tenure. But the idea is what, what, what these are, this is like the seeds of knowledge. And so these people are usually often doing prime, these are the primary sources. These people are spending their lives digging in. And some of them are good, some of them are bad. They're just like anything else. They range. There are some of these papers that are not very well done. Some of them are not accurate, but most of them, they're, they're more likely, especially if they're peer reviewed, um, they're more likely to be, you know, gone through the ringer. So these are the seeds. Now, then there's a lot of people, then there's a lot of people in my genre who will then take that, take like the seeds. Um, there's layers. There's someone, no, there's take the seeds and then publish it. So maybe then, um, New York Times, Gizmodo, New York Mag, um, okay. blogs like mine, uh, Science Magazines, National Geographic. Pop psychology, exactly. commercial they'll business books. They'll now books. take this mm -hmm. finding mm -hmm. and they'll start, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson will get a hold of it and he'll do a special on it. And they'll take the finding and they'll start to package it in a way that is more accessible. So, so the expert does the nine thing. And then the person who can get to a six will use that to get them to a self to a six. And they'll know. So my job is to get myself to a six. Um, and once I'm there, then I write an article. So, but they just say that took me two weeks or three weeks. Now I want to say, how could I, with my smart friends, 
get them to where I am or some or, or to the important parts of where I am, what, get them the gist of what I know now in like an hour and a half instead of three weeks? How could I do this efficiently? So that's the first thought. While retaining the pretty fresh learning brain uh, yes. of being able to explain. And it's great because a lot of the, the reason experts are often not great at teaching is first of all, it's just a different, different skill and they might have it, they might not. Uh, you know, it's a totally different skill. Um, secondly, they haven't been an amateur in a long, long time. And they've been using jargon and it's hard to remember. I know exactly what jargon not to use or to only use it with a serious explanation. And I know if there was one part that was particularly hard for me to understand, it really took a lot. I know that's gonna be hard for readers too. So I'm going to really try to explain it well. I'm gonna, what was the epiphany that really had me get it eventually? Okay, I'm gonna really try to make sure they get that epiphany. Um, and so I will try to bring them, I'll start at the very beginning, assuming they, don't, they know very little, and then I'll try to bring them upwards to um, upwards to at least a five or a six, because that's really pleasurable and enjoyable to get there because it's so stimulating. Now getting beyond there on often is not that enjoyable. I think it can be gratifying eventually just to know you're an expert. But to me, that's when it starts to get very technical and you start to get into kind of conflicting theories of the technical side. And like, you know, there, there, if you really get into, you know, AI, you'll have deep, you know, deep theories of different kinds of, you know, theoretical frameworks for machine learning, for example, that that to me, I'm like, I, that's not interesting. I understand the basic deal with machine learning. And now if I become a super expert on like the, the, the conflicting theories, I don't know anything that that's that fun to talk about. Yeah. It's more than now I could maybe get into the industry a little bit, but yeah. I don't, I don't want to do that. That's not my goal. So I don't want to get to a seven or eight. It's also, it takes tons of time to uh -huh. do it well. Cause the it's longer you Dunning go the, chain, thing. The, yeah. the, the, the more, when you start learning, you realize there's a lot to learn. And then when you try to go up to a seven or eight, you realize how far away you are from it actually, you know, you, you, to be at an eight, you need to be able to sit on a debate stage with another expert and really go at it. And 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 I'm definitely not prepared to do that. Um, I'm prepared to moderate a panel of experts and to do a talk for layman I, and do a great blog post, you know, and that's exactly where I am. But um, there's a whole, and, and, and I'm not gonna write the journal yeah. article on it, you know? And so that's, that's what I think. And so William Slater, he, in his own way, he basically says, here's a concept that I know, he's, he's writing for me for sure. He was definitely writing for, I'm sure, his self as a kid. You know, curious little sixth grader, right, who loves science fiction ideas. And, um, and he would basically bring me up to speed throughout the book. I started with SpaceX. I started at, you know, um, the, the, the evolution of humans and us looking up at the stars and wondering for the first time. And, and, then, and then the origin of our first time we could go into space. Because I was like, let's get all on the same page here. Let's all get on the same footing. Let's build that tree trunk of the knowledge tree so that we can then stick branches onto it. If you don't have a tree trunk, then the branches aren't fun to read because you don't get them and they just fall to nothing. You don't remember them. So it's that, so he does that. And then the other thing he does, the second thing he does is that he made it really entertaining. Sci-fi, of course, is gonna be intentionally entertaining. It's he, gonna gets be, the, he gets the baseline and he takes it into a fictional place. Yeah, as opposed he to uses a fiction. Yeah. So it's, page, it's a page turner, you know, total page turners, which makes it also addictive. So now you're learning and you're expanding your mind with real science concepts in a super fun way. So it's harder with nonfiction. I definitely am not as entertaining as William Slater, but what I try to do is if I can do a cliffhanger in some way and say, you know, but no one knew what was gonna come next, you know, and if, if that's true, I'm not gonna over dramatize, but usually there's so much drama just in the fiction. Mm -hmm. um, there's so much drama in the present moment thinking about the future. Like we really are in a thriller movie right now. You just have to kind of extract that, just tap into the, the actual true drama that is in embedded in all of this insanely cool stuff and you can then and then you know i try to be funny i try to do i do little drawings. elements yeah exactly I'll, I'll try to make people laugh and i'll do little drawings and i'll um make fun of you know the u.s and russia um going you know in a, in a space race um with a little stick figure you know two stick figures standing next to each other in a penis measuring contest because that's what they were doing in front of the whole world when they were in the space race and i'll just try to like make it um silly and fun so that it so that it's like and visual so that's how i like to read so i feel like he does that for me, as, bad, as well as anyone who writes for kids has ever done. And, and I think I you know, implicitly learned a bunch of stuff. And thank you for giving us a great tour through both your mind and how you think about kind of that, that sort of linear level, you know, of, of getting from layman, defining layman, getting up to kind of one or two to sort of four or five, six. Um, but how do you, the only thing I'm left with in, in this information overload world is how do you distill the vast amounts of spew coming out of the world at all of us. Seth, Seth Godin, in my interview with him, described himself as a whale cruising around with his mouth open for plankton. You know, <laughs> uh, do you have a metaphor that you think about? And, and can you also give some advice for, for me and listeners who are like, it's just overwhelming right now with how much stuff there is. Yeah. How do you cruise through this murky sea 
Any yeah. tips well, on first that? of all, just while we're on that, Seth Godin to me is like, if, if I have a wise man on a hill in my life, Seth Godin is, um, is that guy. Like, I just, he writes this daily blog post and I'm basically like, anything that happens in the world, I want to hear what Seth then, thinks about it, what he says about it. Because that's someone who, you know, wisdom is, look, you, and the older you get, the more advanced, the more collected experiences you have, but that there's a gap between that and wisdom. It converts into wisdom with a ton of reflection and thought. Which it takes humility. You can't grow if you're not humble, right? You're not in a position to grow. You're not, you can, you, humble, non-humble people don't ask questions. They don't self-reflect. They don't reconsider their own previous views. So they, just, they, they freeze where they are. And so all this new experience is coming in and it's just passing through. It's not turning into wisdom. So someone like Seth, you can tell He's constantly reconsidering. He's constantly playing with his own ideas and testing them. Are they still good? He's looking at the world and not just immediately assuming. He's pondering it for a while. He's bringing it into his framework. He's thinking about what it means. So someone like that, if you're just accumulating a little bit of wisdom every year, just a little bit, when you're, I don't know, he's, I don't know, he's you know, 40s or 50s, whatever he is, whenever you get there, like the older you get, you start to become really, really wise. So I'm also really trying to be someone like Seth who gets wiser as he gets older. Um, but... Anyway, that's, um, I also do see him and, and a yeah. few others of my, you know, intellectual heroes as people who. <laughs> Any two or three names for us listening? Sam Harris. Mm -hmm. um, Sam Harris, you know, writes about AI. He writes yeah. about, you know, ethics. He writes about religion. He writes about politics. He writes about spirituality. Yeah. This is just someone who has confidence in his own brain. Yeah. He knows that his brain has the power to, to take on a new topic that he's a layman at and spends enough time with it that he has valuable stuff to say about and then it. goes on public debates and then he, and then he, yeah exactly so he's a, obviously a you know super smart guy but i think a lot of people more people yeah. could be like sam harris if they just so many people have this myth of expertise you know they think oh well um ai well there's experts i'm not i can't go on a panel why not like why couldn't yeah. you what what did they what oh they went to school for it are they what, they, what what school you read a bunch of stuff you hear a smart person talk you can hear that person talk on youtube you can read a bunch of stuff like you don't need to take tests and get your grade to have expertise so and, and I, I would think Sam wouldn't claim to be a total expert, but he he can, on the philosophical side, on like the implication side, he can basically get to the point where he can talk about it with experts. And I think a lot more people could be like that if they uh, if they had opened up to it. So your question about initial question about but and you brought up Seth curating. Yeah, I, I basically look I. I especially now that I started writing this blog, I get a lot of emails and I talk to a lot of interesting people. I'm, there's a million things I want to write about. It's, 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 it's really overwhelming. And um, I think it's almost, it helps. There's so many that I know I'll never get to them all. So then my perfectionism can relax. It's like, okay. It's like reading all the books in the world. I, because I'm, I don't have to read all the books in the world, then I can just pick a good book and read it without saying, well, is it, it, you know, which... So I, I feel like with, um, with writing, I... Um, but there are only so many dumplings. And there's, so many books. There's a ton of topics. And new topics are springing up every yeah. single year. I mean, three years ago, CRISPR wasn't a topic. Yes. Cryptocurrency wasn't a topic. Um, brain machine interfaces wasn't really a topic. These are all topics now. And, and things move quicker. So in three years, there's going to be five new topics. That's just talking about the future. I also like to write about procrastination and why yeah, we relationships. care so much what other people think of us in relationships. <laughs> it's, it's never making fun of society. You know, never going to run out. One other note on William Slater while we're here um, is that in, I think around... 2009, I just remembered what it, I forgot about him entirely. And I was like, oh, I love him. And I just thought, you know, this is the age of the internet. And I had done this once before with a, this is a, a little kid's song tape called Animal Alphabet that I'm obsessed with. Um, and I, uh, that was just very local, also not famous at all. Some guy named Podolsky, something. something. Um, and I went online and I like looked at him. And I realized I could email him, so I emailed him and I was like, "I'm obsessed with your stuff." It like totally opened my mind in the music what, world. What is it? It's it's called Animal Alphabet. It okay. goes from A to Z. Okay. Each two minute song basically with an animal that starts with that letter, and it's like personifying the animal. Right. Okay. But it's good music. He's yeah. a talented. We'll guy. link to it in the show notes. And I was about three, four, or five listening to it constantly. And so when I was literally three, literally three, my parents have this video, this, this videotape of me and they're saying Q and I'm going 17. It's the 17th letter of the alphabet. And they say F and I go seven. It's the seventh letter of the alphabet, you know, W 23. And they were mind blown. They were like, is this kid a genius? But I wasn't, I was just obsessed with this, this tape. And so I'd be like, this is the 11th song. This is the 12th song. So I was just weird. So I emailed him and it was really gratifying to like say thank you. So I emailed William Slater. Oh. Um, maybe 2009, and I was like, just want to say, like, your books totally changed changed my mind. Like, just my favorite, you know, 
my favorite childhood author. And he wrote back and he was like, that means so much. Thank you so much. You know, and it was just so gratifying. And so then I start, wait, but why? A couple years later, I'm like, oh, I'm a real writer now. I want to like show him that I'm a writer. You know, this guy, I was so like excited for him to maybe read one of my things. And I emailed him and I, you know, no response. And I looked him up and he died. Yeah. He died in between. He but died in 2000. So on one hand, I was so sad, but I was so happy. I wrote him that email then. before at least. But I was, it was, it was super sad. So. But at the same time, you yes. did give him the gratification. I was so happy to have emailed him before, my God. Yeah, and and it's and also I wonder if that email would have been different to him before or after. Like maybe it would have meant the same. You know what I mean? Like uh, yeah, like is an email from someone famous worth more than you know someone who's? Oh you, you yeah, know what I mean that's what it's I'm, more that I just wanted. I wanted to like send him one of my things because yeah. it would be so gratifying to have him read I anything it from, I did. Yeah, and yeah, I took just it, I, I took I, it from a him. writer hero of mine. Yeah. Good, a good reminder for all of us to um, reach out. I interviewed uh, four or three books, uh, Dave Barry, and he made, he's like, the beautiful thing about this this idea is that the people that you're talking to are all accessible. Yeah. Like you can get in touch with writers. Yeah. They don't hide. They go Especially to bookstores for Especially if they're not people. a huge deal. You know, if your favorite writer is Malcolm Gladwell, okay, you know, he, he gets a lot of praise already. <laughs> but if you have a favorite writer or musician or something that, and they're not like hugely famous, they probably don't get very, very many emails. And like, if you, especially if they were a big part of your childhood, like let them know. Yeah. yeah, at least hashtag them. All right, over to book number three. A couple we've we've hinted at this book a couple times with mentions of individualism and and curiosity. So this is the big one, literally uh, and physically here. Uh, your third and final book is The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand, uh, written in 1943, published by the Bob's Merrill Company, which eventually was sucked into Macmillan. This one's filed in Dewey, uh, 813.52, American fiction, written between 1900 and 19. 19- 45. Ayn Rand, of course, was the Russian-American novelist who lived from 1905 to 1982. And this book, which has sold about 7 million copies, um, is her first major literary success. The novel's protagonist, Howard Roark, is an individualistic young architect who designs modernist buildings and refuses to compromise with an architectural establishment unwilling to accept innovation. Roark, Roark embodies what Rand believed to be the ideal man, and his struggle reflects Rand's belief that individualism is superior to collectivism. Tell us about your relationship with The Fountainhead as I hand you my, literally my copy from when I was a kid with everyone's name inside, which I, for some reason, was writing down every name who I convinced people to read this. So here's my, in three actual pieces, the cover, the two-thirds, and the back. They're held together by a rubber band. My old vintage copy of The Fountainhead. shitty book. I like it. (laughs) I was beaten up. And I love that we got a nice crispy crunch of your avocado toast while I was mm-hmm. giving my good. little... I like that, too. Uh, so tell us about your relationship with The Fountainhead. I think this yeah. is going to be... I'm really... I've been re- waiting you know, I, to hear you talk about it. Until today, Neil, I never once realized that I like the stinky cheese man and The Fountainhead for the same reason. But it's hitting me that it's the same lesson I learned in both. Just one is a fifth grader, one is older. The, the stinky cheese man I learned about reasoning from first principles because the author of the book did it in writing the book. And in The Fountainhead, I learned about it because the characters, the characters in the book um, exemplify this concept. So it's for different reasons, but... Um, so, Anne Rand... And, so and, open that up for me I, I, so I can follow that, that principle? Yeah, so the, the reasoning from first yeah. principles? No, no, just what's the comparison between the Stinky Cheese so Man? The, the Stinky Cheese Man taught me about reasoning from first principles because the author clearly did it by doing all this stuff you're not supposed to do. And Rand wrote about a character who's ah, great at reasoning right. from first principles. So I learned from the character and I learned from the author of the other book. But it's the same lesson, actually. Um, and, and this lesson, by the way, is everywhere. If you look at your iPhone, the reasoning from first principles versus reasoning from analogy, there's the lesson. I mean, what, when, when Apple created a phone, did they say, well, where should the keyboard be, you know? It should be a really Apple-y keyboard. Let's make it really sleek. No, they said, what should a mobile device be? And they didn't care if conventional wisdom said you have to have a keyboard. They just reasoned from first principles, and they started puzzling their way upwards to their conclusion. And by the time they got there and to their answer, there was no keyboard at all. Everyone said, you can't do that. You can't do that. You have to have a keyboard. And now what, every single smartphone copied them, right? I mean, so this, this lesson is everywhere. Basically, everything you see that, you know, every disruption of an industry, there's someone reasoning from first principles. And... Every um, every breakout new artist, um, 
Then there's a lot of copycats. A new sound, a new yeah. chef with a new cuisine. Exactly. And, and actually, yeah. and I've, I've written about this in the context of Elon Musk, who I think, you know, people say, what is his secret sauce? Why is this guy able to do all the stuff he can do? And in my opinion, yeah, sure, he's smart. He's rich. He's influential. He's hardworking. But a lot of people are those things. If that was all he was, he would be, be more Elon Musk's. To me, it's that he's he and Steve Jobs and many others are exceptional reason, you know, reasoners from first principles. And so what I, I, I term this the cook and the chef. So people use these terms interchangeably, but the way I use them is a chef, let's say, writes recipes. So, so the first principles of a chef, of an original chef, are ingredients. So raw ingredients. And they, he'll mess around, make a bunch of bad stuff, willing to fail a lot, but ends up somehow, you know, once in a while, creating something good. And it's almost going to be definitely new and original because he wasn't following any recipe. He was just doing it. Then that thing becomes a recipe. And all the, sh the, what I'm calling cooks in the world, people who reason by analogy, will just follow that recipe. The recipe becomes their, re the recipe becomes their Bible. Um, and they will follow it. And um, without really thinking about it necessarily. And they won't have the confidence to think they could have created something new. Only brilliant chefs can do that. But actually, this chef was trying a bunch of stuff, like a, almost like a kid, just like playing with ingredients and eventually hit on something. So I'd like to think of this as the cook and the chef. The chef is the original and the cook follows the chef's recipes, right? And so Steve Jobs was a chef, right? Wasn't the smartest guy in the world, just a really great chef, just kind of almost had a disdain for the way things were and often thought that if I have an idea that's different than the way things are, I'm probably smarter than the way things are. And that's not arrogant, actually. It's that the way things are is often based on 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, the way things were done. It's often fear-based in the first place. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, again, you can go too far because you always want to have your integrity come first. Steve Jobs also, like, kind of abandoned his child as a kid. That's a real first principles thing to do. You know, he's saying other people wouldn't do that, but I don't, I do my things my own way. Well, that was not a great thing to do. And so um, I think that, you know, you, you can go too far. You want to also have that, like, you know, it has to be below your integrity, as I said. But anyway, back to the Fountainhead. So the Fountainhead, which is very controversial, and it's, the book is less controversial than it's just it's polarizing, but she's very polarizing. And for you know for reasons we don't have to get into, it's 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 another whole topic. But uh, and I haven't read Atlas Shrugged, Shrugged, which is her other book, Atlas Shrugged. It's um, even more controversial. I just read this one book, but I loved it, and I loved it because I also thought it was a great story. I was um, twenty five, and I loved it because. Um, it's when I started to realize what it was. First, I was like, these characters are ridiculous. Like, these aren't like real people. There's two main characters. In the, well, there's a few characters, and they actually all are important. But the two main characters in the book, you've got Peter Keating and Howard Rourke. And these are the same age guys, architects. They're in school together. And what I started to realize is that these are both... Well, I'll get into what they, I realized later. So let me just tell you about them. So Peter Keating is the golden boy. You know, he's the star athlete in the school. He gets all the ladies. He gets straight A's. He's their class speaker. Um, top job. And then he gets a top job right out of school. And, um, and then he climbs up in that job. You know, he's political. He, he quickly manipulates to get to the top. And then there's Howard Work, who um, his... He, the school hated him, but his his certain professors loved him. They said he's the best student I've ever had. But other students, uh, the other ones, you know, the 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 the, the ones that were just math raw math. Yeah. Exactly, it was math. The, pe the 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 raw kind of core skills professors loved him because he was amazing at it. The ones who hated him were design. You know, who said this is you know you, you, we, we, the assignment was to design a Renaissance building, and whatever it was, and um, and he just did this. This, what is this appalling you know, thing he did, which is this modern looking thing. And, and so he ended up failing out and he didn't care because he was there to learn and he learned what he needed to learn. And then he wanted to go and get mentored by somebody he wanted to get mentored by who he respected. And then he wanted to start making stuff, right? So it's not necessarily a lesson on career paths. I don't think getting a top job is a bad move uh, necessarily, but it's about the way they were thinking. So one core little, um, there's a really nice little, uh, little anecdote from the book where there's there's I think that yeah this goes back to 
Right. So the, I think the professor, the, 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 the design professor has, or maybe he's the head of the school, has Rourke in the office to talk about this mm. problem. And he says, you know, this is a Renaissance building. Why would you do this way? Renaissance buildings, you know, a beautiful, or, or you know, the, he's saying that a beautiful building today in the Renaissance style has these moldings, these, these, these gargoyle moldings or whatever it was, right? And then Rourke says, those moldings are only there because back when they were designing like this, they had to cover up like the, the corners or the pipes or whatever it was. And there was no other way to cover it up. It was a practical need. We, we now have a much better way to do that. There's no pipes there. There's no, why would we cover it up with old moldings? We don't need to do that. And the, the, the professor was all worked up and said, that's, that's just how it's done, right? So it's, a, it's an interesting example of making me think about what are the moldings in the world that I'm in now where it's, it's the way things, you know, for example, one item is, you know, one thing I tr think I've done well with, um, in my, in, in, as a chef, because, you know, it's hard. I'm a cook a lot of the time, but I've, I'm trying to point, think about ways Actually, I've been a chef to tap into that side of me <laughs> in other areas. You know, one area is I, um, I'm a, I've always been a chef traveler. I like went to North Korea. You're not supposed to do that. I went to Iraq recently. I, not just to be done, not just to do it. I think these places are interesting. I've been to many others and I'm not going to exclude places that are interesting because people tell me they're dangerous if, if my reasoning tells me that it's not going to be dangerous, which takes some homework. You can be stupid and go to dangerous places, but Kurdish Iraq and North Korea with a guide is not dangerous. And I did enough homework to know that. Um, so, uh, so that's an area where I'm just, I'm very good at when, when, when someone says, uh, though you can't go there, I say, you're probably wrong. You probably have little experience with this. Conventional wisdom's probably wrong. Let me do some reasoning, right? If I could just be like that everywhere, I'd be the king of the world, but I'm not. You know, most of the time I listen to the thing like we all do. I listen to that conventional wisdom and says, well, you can't do that or you shouldn't do this. So I try to say, what is it about me as a traveler that has this Steve Jobs like, like, like attitude towards it? that enables me to see all this great stuff and, and go to these cool places that other people are deprived of for no reason. And I try to tap into that. And so with my writing, one area where I've done it, but I'm always struggling with this as a writer. So it's like, I don't want to, you know, no, claim to uh, figure it out. I want you to trump it a little bit here because I, I think really highly of your work. So let's hear it. What's well, what the, I was yeah. going to say is the uh, doing long articles was very much, conventional wisdom said you have to do short articles, right? But I think... To me, that felt a little like one of these moldings on a Renaissance building where, well, that's because articles originated in print and you can't take up the whole magazine with an article, first of all. Secondly, um, magazines had to sell to enough of people to make it worthy. So they had to sell to a mass audience and the mass audience is probably overall going to prefer, you know, short, snappy things. They're not going to want to dig deep on average. So as a blogger, there's no limit with pages and you can cater to 1% of people who happen to really like to dig deep. And those people are really going to appreciate that you went long because every other article about this thing stuff anywhere. is short. Mm -hmm. And this is almost like a mini book. And it's for people who don't want to read a full book. They don't want to read a blog post. And it's kind of, okay, invent your new category, right? It's like the iPad in between the phone and the, the computer. Um, and so... Blue ocean. Yes. So that's an area where... And, and by the way, a lot of times you're going to be wrong. There's going to be a molding that was there for a good reason. Uh, you'll do long articles and no one will read them or people will get bogged down. And by the way, I'm still toiling with whether too long is too long. So I think actually shorter would be better. Not totally short, though. Like New Yorker length, maybe. Seth Godin has a, 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 goes the opposite way. He's got exactly. like 100 and word posts. Exactly. Even less. Sometimes it's like, you know, 15 word posts. <laughs> and I think about them for 10 years, you know. So um, <laughs> find your. I can, I can like take yeah. your gargoyles off your post. Pillars in your life. Or, in your or just life. look at look at mm -hmm. when you're considering what how to how to do something, how to create what you create, how to strategize in your job, how to pick your job, how to you know how to surprise your your boyfriend or girlfriend on their birthday. Like, stop for a second and think about your first look. at The easiest thing is going to be to photocopy what's already been done. It's just, that's already there. Someone else has already done the work. So it's gonna be the, the first in, the first thing you come up with is gonna be almost always derivative. The first ideas I have for blog posts are almost always derivative of something I read. I'm copying Seth Godin, I'm copying someone else. And it, then it takes, and then you have to decide now, is this worth the opportunity cost to go further? Again, when I, when I pick out clothing, I intentionally conform. I'm not gonna try to express my individuality with clothing because it's not somewhere I choose to. Some people, I think it's great that they do, I don't. So I will, spend no time picking out. We'll go into the J. Crew and pick out a bunch of normal looking things um, and I'll wear them, right? But then other times when it comes to something like writing, I will then go through the toil to just get dig deep and, and I, I will 
basically tried to create something original by going deep into myself. So if I'm trying to write about why we care so much what other people think of us, right? I'm not going to just think about the obvious things. I'm going to dig deep into the experience that I have when I am super self-conscious about what other people are going to think or when, yeah. I'm, when I'm craving praise. What is going on there? And then I'll, if I dig deep enough, I'll find the little kind of original take on it that's my own, you know, little lens. Everyone has their own little lens. So then I, if I can describe that lens, there's a lot of other people that happen to think the same way. And then you will end up um, having done something that, um, that isn't like everything else that's out there, right? So, uh, so I think, so, the, so, so the, the, this Renaissance column, you know, is it just one example? There's a lot in the book. Yeah. And, and, and the, the, what I realized later is that these aren't meant to be, Howard Work is actually not a very likable guy. He's really extreme as a character. And he's too, you know, he's, he's so, you know, too cool for school with everything. And so he's actually, a lot of people think he's annoying and that's fair. Um, and Keating, people sometimes people feel bad for you know he's, but he also you know you can you can see he's so flawed in so many ways. And I think what the idea is that both of these are meant to be one-dimensional representations mm. of the perfect cook and the perfect chef. In my mind, this is I think what she's doing. Yeah. And all of, both of these characters are in all of our heads, and so you want to channel your inner work at certain times, not you know just let your Keating take over because that's what society is ask is telling you to do is just be a Keating, is to try to find that inner work who, who has intense intense integrity and intense confidence in in your own core ability to reason and 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 and, and make a decision without the help of conventional wisdom um, that really fits the decision that really fits you know really seems correct based on your reasoning and then actually act on it and run with it and I think that that's super important to be able to do it's amazing uh, such a good description of, of the two characters I never thought of them that polarizing and and that sort of Everyone's got a Keating. Everyone's got a Roark. You know, I'm 38. I read this book uh, to prepare for chatting with you about it for the first time in like 20 years. I read it as a teenager. I loved it. I evangelized for it. I got friends to read it. I wrote their names on the inside of the cover. And like a lot of people, as they get older, for some reason, I want to ask you about this. People like I, I kind of wore off of it and or and I sold my other Ayn Rand books like I sold. I, you know, I got rid of them. I kept just this one, this first one, the Fountainhead one. Well, can you explain a little bit about what what I, if you can visualize a graph time on the bottom Love of Ayn Rand on, on, on the, on the y-axis. How would you draw that graph? You know, in 2016 in USA Today, when asked what his favorite book is, Donald Trump said, The Fountainhead. Okay, and, and a lot of uh, prominent Republicans are saying, you know, that today. Uh, a lot of people denounce it, uh, despise it, get rid of it, burn their copies, and, and you know, kind of, what is this? Is it the Keating Roark mental battle, or is it something else that makes a lot of people... Um, well, weighing off of... Look, um, Ayn Rand's a little bit extreme, and, you know, there, maybe she lacks some compassion and other things that I can see why, you know, the typical kind of left, person on the left, would maybe have a adver adverse reaction to her. But I think, you know, you don't have to be so extreme where it's like you either love everything in it or you hate everything in it. Because that's what, that's what partisan people do. They have to be one... They have to be extreme one way or the other, especially if something is liked by one politician. They have to... And I think that it's just, there's no nuance in that. So to me, um, I, I, I think about all this, the, you know, I think there's a lot of little, little moments in this book that I remember. One of them is um, a character, Gail Wynan, is standing on um, a, a boat looking out at the ocean and saying, I don't understand why people worship nature. You know, nature's so beautiful, men's so terrible, we're so awful, it's a self-loathing thing. I think that nature is just what it is. That's, you know, uh, I think that, the, the species that learn how to build a ship that can cross that ocean is way cooler than the ocean itself. I worship man. And I think that, you know, the, 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 it's almost like the, at its best, so let's just look at the, at its best. Progressivism is looking at what is, or, or conservatism at its best is looking at what is good in our society that should be, that we want to preserve and, and worrying about it de being degraded. Progressivism at its best is looking at what's not good in our society still and trying to continue to make it better, trying to get the bad things out. Whoa, that's right? a really amazing distillation. At, the, at its best, and yeah. the two of them together form a great team, right? And one of them alone is not is only focusing on half the story, right? And and it's actually it's like you know it reminds me of my um I, I, I was in business for a long time and my um my business partner um I, I would be like pie in the sky guy I would like be like, oh, let's do this and this and this and this and this. And he would say, well, okay, but that's going to cost this and this is going to be not practical for this. 
And together we were a good team. And it's almost like we intentionally both dug deeper into our roles because we knew the other one was the other side of it. So I was, we each were playing half of a brain that together was this really good brain. And I think at its best, smart progressives, smart conservatives who are thoughtful are like this. And they, they, they've chosen, because one of those two sides, you know, making things better that are, uh, and preserving what's good, one of those two sides taps into them better for some reason. Whatever it is, great. If you feel strongly about one, run with it, go with it. But realize that the other side of that is very, very valuable uh, at its best. So what people do is because we're, they look at the – so then as you go down this ladder kind of of consciousness, I think, you, you, you take the, you know, the, 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 the conservatives at the top of this ladder. As I said, they, have, they, they love the country. They, they, love, they have empathy for people, all this. And as you move down, they become – so as you move down, look, trying to preserve what's good gets distorted into we are perfect. We are the best. Outsiders are bad. Don't let them in. You know, uh, anything that's new is bad. Change is bad, right? It's, that's a very simplistic, childish, and overly black and white ideology. As you move down on the left, you move progressivism goes from let's make this even better. Let's be, you know, patriotically, like let's, we have this, 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 this experiment, let's keep working on it, making it better. Goes down to we are awful, corporations are awful, you know, white people are awful, the West is awful. And if only, you know, the, we, the, the, we could just all disappear, the rest of the world could live in harmony. That's also simplistic and ridiculous, right? These are over the top black and white simplistic things. And so I think what people on either side do is they look at the other side's bottom and they say, look at what they think. Well, yeah, that's what the really tribal, really childish people think in the echo chambers. But like, how about what the smart... And, the, and so I know a lot of... I, I'm in a progressive world for the most part. And I know my progressive friends, they don't really think of, you know, they think of conservatism as bad, but it's not. It's the, it's, it's the distortion of conservatism that's bad. So anyway, back to Ayn Rand. I think that there's a lot in here that is the good kind of conservatism. Um... Um, I think worshiping man as opposed to nature is very anti the left. But I think there's something, we need some self-esteem sometimes. And that like, you know, we're a species that's almost like an adolescent. Like we've made some big mistakes and we're kind of a mess, but we're trying our best here as a species and like we're getting better and have some like, not just compassion, but some reverence for how what, we went to the moon. Like we're, we're pretty cool. Like I think that's an important thing to keep in mind as you try to improve. Um, and I think that rubs them the wrong way. And I think this kind of individualism of Howard Rourke rubs them wrong, the wrong way. But I think, you know, grouping is bad. Um, it's not good to, um, I don't think it's good to treat big groups of people like they're, like they're all the same. You know, this isn't, you know, the left knows this when it comes to diversity uh, of identity. They don't ever want anyone saying all black people are, all white people are. Well, they do want to say all white people are. They don't want to say this about um, the marginalized identities. That's, they're, very, they're very good about that, right? But they're very bad about it when it's, they'll say all Trump voters are, you know, all cops are. You know, they, and I think that um, there's a tendency on both sides of the really, you know, bad political kind of mentality is to group the out group, whoever that out group is for you, into one thing. And I think that um, Howard Rourke is an example of like a true, just like individual. And I think that, um, so yeah, there's a lot of points I just made, but, but the, 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 the bigger point is just because um, uh, Donald Trump likes the book and a lot of Republicans like the book, you know, maybe there's some wisdom, maybe there's some Republican wisdom that we can get without adapting everything. And, 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 and yes, there maybe Donald Trump has some very, very bad views or has some very bad behavior. It doesn't mean that everything he hates is bad. That is a super simplistic way to look at it. So um, I think this book shouldn't be politicized. I think it's a lesson for everyone. And I think that and I, I, there's a lot of things I'm considering that I don't necessarily think are 100% correct, but it's, it gave me a lot to consider, and that's yeah. worth reading. Absolutely. When you write a book on one side, you also are forced to do your time. Is that... Um, yeah. Oh, no, no, I'm just oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I couldn't tell if you were giving the, the no. five minute warning or not because I, I, I just two small things on the fountainhead, and then I want to get into the fast money questions to close us off here, Tim. One is, you mentioned Ayn Rand's very controversial. Um, she notably, it's easy to Google Ayn Rand controversial quotes, and like a lot of horrific stuff comes up. Um, how do you separate art from artist? Um, I think that's important to do. Um, I. When I'm eating at a restaurant, I really don't care what the chef's viewpoints are. If the chef is racist, then, you know, that's a separate world that is not really, you know, like, yes, if I, if I know the chef is specifically horrible in some ways, maybe I don't want to give that chef business. But that's a very specific boycott. That I, It's not really a time for activism for me. It's like, um, so I think that I, I, I'm really all about separating the art from artists. Art is just, um, to me, 
another way of communication. It's um, you can speak in words or you can kind of paint a thought. Our, our, our thoughts are way more nuanced than our compressed languages. You know, we have to compress nuanced thoughts into these big word buckets and we hand them to each other and then you have to decompress and figure out what I what nuanced thought I was yeah. actually put into that bucket. Which is why those books about words and other languages that don't exist in our own are so fascinating. Yeah. Because you're like, Another yeah. language is another lens on life for yeah. that reason. And all of them are poor attempts to capture the nuance that goes on in the human brain. And um, so art to me is, uh, is just another attempt to communicate like human emotion, human experience, human concepts, human nuance. So it was comedy, um, which is part of art, I guess. Um, and so I think that, um, I think if someone creates something that, is, that can offer me value and make me a better person and make me a wiser person, I'm not gonna dig into every single thing they did. I'm not gonna look at, you know, it's, this is also this view of um, let's take down all these statues. And I'm like, but what about the, and sorry to, you yeah. know, I don't mean to bring it to today, but like, say, would you, would you look at Louis C.K., okay? Or, or, or like these, there's a lot of like um, big name people have been brought down. Um, is there is their comedy still funny? You, you know what I mean? And, and I'm, I'm just, I don't wanna get into that. I think it is, yeah. yeah. Look, I think it is. Am I gonna look for the worst? Do I don't want to hear about the worst anecdote from Martin Luther King's childhood? You know, it's not relevant to me. You know, it's it's this, it's the spirit of what he did. Is I don't care what he did in his personal life. Am I going to look at like you know like George Washington owned slaves? He also released them at the end of his life. He also waited till the end of his life to release people who were living their one lives. It's pretty reprehensible in my opinion. It wasn't the worst because he really. It's pretty reprehensible. To me, there's still a um an, a, a a big kind of overarching. You no, know, look at. Uh, Aristotle and Nietzsche and these guys, these guys have some very, very, what Not we would consider even, reprehensible yeah, views. Yeah. Um, and I just think that it's, to me, when someone's being, here's the thing, here's the big point. When someone's being reprehensible, I don't think, I think almost no one is evil. I think they're being a child. I think the child in them has taken over. This animal, this, you know, this inner kind of tribal animal has gotten a hold of their brain and has um, and they're out of control of it. I think this is the same thing that happens when someone is overeating, is procrastinating, is has an anger problem. Um, and so when I see when, up I, too when late. I hear about like you know on the um, on the left, the worst thing you can be is a racist. When I hear about like if someone's like here's a racist Trump voter, I'm like I see an ignorant person who probably could have easily grown up grown up in a you know, one family, a one parent household. I don't know what they did, maybe impoverished. Maybe they were never that educated. Maybe um, there's drug problems in their family. I don't know. But what I see is someone who's, for whatever reason, there's a child in their head. It, racism is the only, it could be the work of children. It's only the work of children. It's a simplistic mindset that only a child could believe. So I'm saying, that, yes, that, that person is stunted in that area. And I have compassion for them. Um, if I see a gang member shoot someone, I'm like, you know, I'm not going to be like, that's an evil person. What was their childhood like? What's their life? I'm going to have compassion for them. But the compassion doesn't extend only to my political in-group. It's for everyone. You have to have that, right? And so if I see um, Louis C.K., I see that, yeah, he was a, he has a problem and he needs to get a hold of himself. It doesn't, it doesn't let people off the hook. It's not that you should, oh, and give everyone a hug. I mean, he'd hurt a lot of people. And, you know... You've got I don't mean to use him in particular. I meant the idea of it. So, yeah, yeah I think, you're saying... I think, yeah. I think to me, it's like... Yeah. These... Basically, if the adult in, in that person has offered up a really great nugget of wisdom or a great piece of art, and then the child in that person has done bad things, to me, it's like, that's their problem. And I'm going to take the good thing from what they do. And I'm going to enjoy it or I'm going to try to make the best of it. And I said, I said, find one, you know, activist hero, one kind of, um, and look at the things they've done in their life. And you're going to find a lot of bad things. And, and, and look at things you've done in your life. And th the worst things you've done, if you take the worst thing in anyone's life, suddenly you're going to, they're going to seem pretty bad. And I think mm -hmm. like, um, I, I just think that, uh, again, this is not to like, some people do worse things than others and they can really damage and hurt other people. And those people should be very criticized and penalized for it, for sure. But I think that um, their art is this piece of value they've put out into the world. And, you know, it's like, if, what, what if Louis C.K. donated a million mosquito nets to Africa? We should take them all and throw them away. No, we'll still use the mosquito nets. Louis C.K. has a lot of wisdom. He talks about white privilege in the most elegant way, you know, that made me really consider. No! We don't want to lose that. You know, keep that. So I, that, that's that's my long It's answer. all contributing to the the, the sort of, um, I'm doing this thing with my hand right now, like the the... the the growth of human knowledge and human, yes. you know. Each uh, of us is an adult battling with a child and the species as a whole is like a future mm -hmm. adult species battling with a very primal tribal species. And I'm like, 
take what you can from the adults when they can offer it to you. And like the fact that children are involved in that person's brain, that's not a surprise. Like that is how we all are. So. Totally. Ah, what a fascinatingly complex piece of, of insight and wisdom. I, I'm like, my brain right now is trying to get my arms around it, but it's so, how, it's so nuanced how you described it that it's like, there's a lot of pieces to, yeah. to, uh, um, living that way. I, it's one thing to intellectually believe in what you just described. I'm not saying I do or don't because I'm still like kind of processing. I, I, a lot of it makes sense to me, but it's also like then act, to act upon it. Yeah. It's very difficult. I also think there's a really important to look at how someone who has done something bad talks about it. If there's remorse, if I see remorse, I'm, I'm going to have a hard time not being compassionate for the person. Um, depending on what they did. But that's I why mean, there's so much love. If I see, uh, yeah, if I see remorse, yeah. I see someone's adult who is not uh, so who does not sign off on what their child did, who feels horrible about it, who's regretful. And um, again, that doesn't let them off the hook entirely, but it means that I am rooting for them to, to, to improve. It means that I'm not going to like try to destroy their life. And then there's other people who I think don't have remorse. And now you're talking about more of a, a psychopath. And that's a different kind of thing going on. You know, someone who does something bad and they don't care. And that's different. And even psychopath, it's like, they're not evil. They're lacking a core their brain is different than yours. And if your brain were like that, you would act the same way, right? And so it's not that I think psychopaths should be tortured or you're evil. It's just that at some point you have to say, I'm sorry, it's unfortunate, but the way you happen to be is so dangerous for so many other people that you should be in, in jail or kind of off the map because you're dangerous for others. And that's real too. Um, but I think short, like, I don't think Louis C.K. is a psychopath. I think he has a child in his brain that has at certain times totally dominated him. And I think he's struggling. And I would see him like I see an alcoholic or whatever. And alcoholics also hurt people. Alcoholics really hurt people just like Louis did. And people look at an alcoholic and they say, well, they, everyone deserves a second chance. And they say, Louis, because it's, because it's a politicized and it's a very specifically sensitive issue, they say, burn him, you know, like never look at his stuff again, boycott it forever. I, 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 don't, I don't see it that way. Yeah. Wow. We've come a long way from the stinky cheese man. We sure have. And I love it because you've taken it, you're taking us, and this is what your blog post to, what you're writing this, you're, you're taking us to places that we haven't, at least for me, I haven't thought of yet, which is yeah, the beautiful good. thing about, about the work. Um, can we transition now to, to the fast money round closing questions? Let's do it. There is actually no money involved. Unlike Ayn Rand herself, by the way, who I don't know if you know or not, was buried with a, with a dollar sign of flowers on top of her grave. You see, uh, I had a question. I, was I think she probably just that. literally just did that to troll people. She definitely loved <laughs> trolling liberals her whole life. Yeah. Um, so let's go, let's go into the fast money round question. Um, Tim, how do you organize your books? Say I walked into your room full of books, whatever that is in your life today. How are they organized? Well, 90% of them are sadly in a box in my uh, fiance's mother's basement because there's no room in New York apartments. Uh, it's a closet we live in. But... Uh, I have maybe 40 books in the house and so some cu important curating took place already it was it was a, it's a combo of two things it's books that I have not read that I want to read so all these I love having books that I have read on the shelf it's just it reminds me that I've read a bunch of books and it's fun to pull them out once in a while um, it's almost like a it's almost like a trophy shelf but um, I don't have room for those so it's books that I want to read and I haven't read um, and it's books that people have sent me since I moved um, and like you just gave me a book, so this is going to be on one yeah. of the books on my shelf now. Um, and I'll give um, you a fraction of the whole by Steve Toltz, because I hate when you listen to stuff and you don't know what they're talking. So I'm just going to say the oh, name yes. so people. I forgot listen. that wasn't already talked about. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. It's just my yeah. favorite novel, and I thought you'd I thought you'd like it. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm super it excited. It's a, it's a it's a I take that rec very seriously. Um, <laughs> but so the books I want to read are mostly right now. Usually, you know, often they're a lot of different things, but right now they're they're largely geared around books that will help stoke ideas for my book that I'm writing next this later this year, next year. Uh, it's not quite started yet. I'm working on this other blog post first, but, um, and it's a book about everything. It's a big, big book, but it's, um, so it's, uh, I'm doing a lot, a lot of big picture books like Sapiens is on that list. And, um, um, Bill Bryson's a short history of nearly everything and a brief history of time, you know, by Hawking and, um, and then, um, you know, a bunch of, um, and there's other, I want Lolita's on the shelf because I haven't read that and I want to read it. And, and how are they organized? So it's, um, it's, there's a shelf behind my bed and it was just, they're stacked. 
So I'll see them when I walk in the room and get excited. And then there's always one or two right on the nightstand next to me that I want to like actually actively be reading. And those are usually also audiobooks on my phone. I end up buying every book three times right now, which is really a terrible practice. I have the paper book and the audio book, and then I often buy the ebook so I can have it if I don't want to take the book with me. And then, so books cost me 50 bucks now. It's not, it's not sustainable, but... Um, with the price of hardcovers, it might be $100. Yeah, too. that's true. Yeah. Uh, By the way, when you're talking about your book that you're going to be writing, I got really excited because at my foot, I don't know if you can see it right here, but I, I, have, I brought also A Little History of the World by E.H. Gombrich, that's G-O-M-B-R-I-C-H, because I saw, a, I saw a product hunk live you did a couple years ago, and I emailed you, and I said, hey, Tim, you mentioned reading A Little History of the World. I don't know anyone else that's read that book, and I loved it. And you wrote back to me and said, I don't know anyone else that's read that book either, and I loved it. So we had this little mini bromance about A Little History of the World, so I brought it, I brought it with so me. It's so good. Yeah. E. H. Gombrich, A Little History of the World. Super worth reading. It's basically, here's what it is, if I had to describe yeah, it. Yeah, do it. Picture a grandfather sitting around a campfire with a group of children. In 1922. In 1922. When he wrote it, and um, and and telling the the history of everything, um, <laughs> of everything, of everything, literally everything. Well, the history of humanity, basically. Um, and you know, it's not this. It's not really the natural history. Um, it's not getting into physics, but it's it's all about you know the history of humans, um, and and not even getting into biological history. It's really like um, getting back into early written history from then on. You know, it's 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 that. But it's just, there's so much that happened. There's so many chapters that, we, that aren't that famous that we don't, we hear about the Greek empire a lot. You know, we hear about the Roman empire a lot. There's so many others, there's so much stuff. And there's also just little things like, I think it was the Roman, there's little facts all over the place. Like, I think it was the Romans had the, it was either the Romans or the Persians or someone had the, was burning down a bunch of old civilizations and, and they just destroyed them. We lost forever. And they, they had the choice to do that with, you know, the ancient Greece. And because the emperor happened to like value, the emperor at the time happened to value like ancient Greece stuff, ain't like it and value it, pre preserved it, decided to, to keep it. If that emperor decides just like like the other, you know, let's just burn it down. Also, we don't never heard of Aristotle, we never heard of Plato really? or Socrates. Yeah, we never, you know, uh, all of this stuff is just gone. All this early thought, early democracy, so much we've gotten so much from that, and it makes me so sad for the old civilizations that have been intentionally because in the new emperor would say yeah. this is not us, and nothing we don't saved want, on we don't want influence anyone. We don't want to influence. We don't want any, start any bad ideas. And they would, back then it was easy to erase a civilization. You burn a small handful of books basically, and you break down a you know you smash a few buildings, and it's gone. I mean, you wiped it from the earth, and whoever the Aristotle of ancient Persia was, or the ancient Phoenicians, or whatever. Um, we don't know about them. And we don't know, also, it's not just know about what they have to say. We, people still learn from Aristotle, but it's also, um, it's, it's a lesson into where we, where we came from as a species. What did we used to think what fire was? What did we used to think love was? And what do we think about slavery in 1000 BC? And was there were there periods of enlightenment way back then? And what can we learn from the patterns of how those enlightenments turned into dark ages? And so that makes me sad. But anyway, it's my big takeaway from this book is like, Almost all of human history is groups of people slaughtering other groups of people for land, basically, yeah, yeah. Um, and over religion and other things. And it's it's basically just like, we want this land, you want this land, so we're going to fight to the death, and the winner gets the land. That's most of human history. And it's very recent that uh, that we, the fact that we live in, a, in the U.S. here today, we live in a stable country where it's like, there's not going to be an invasion, probably. There's not going to probably be a total collapse of everything. And, yeah. and uh, we're not all going to be slaughtered by a neighboring country. We know that for sure. And our country is not like, you know, um, people can argue what they want, but they're not, they're not like, you know, you know, out there, you know, taking over new territories and dominating the world. So it's, it's to me, it's a very, um, yeah, it just makes me feel fortunate. Well, I was reading uh, Bill Gates's, Bill Gates was recently called um, Enlightenment Now by Steven Pinker. My, my most favorite book of all time. And he writes his summaries online at Gates. He said one of his big takeaways was war is newly illegal. Yeah. Like in like 1955 or some United Nations. Gonna, like it's like it's a newly illegal thing. So anyway, just to, just to digress uh, uh, backwards, we're saying A Little History of the World by E.H. Gombrich is, is potentially your fourth Yeah. Maybe three B fourth book or third. Yeah, third. in fact, if, if if the theme is books that aren't well known, the Fountainhead's very well known. This book is would be oh. a third book that is not well known. Oh, a little okay. history of the world, but it's I think it's um it's excellent and uh and a lot of people who aren't history buffs who don't love 
um, you know, getting into the nitty gritty would like this. It's a big overview told in a way that is uh, meant to be entertaining. We both recommend it. And I, now I look at it a little more closely. I realize it was um, written in 1935, not 1922. My, my mistake. And this was a takeoff of how do you organize your books? Um, so that's the first question. The second question is, what is your favorite bookstore in the world, living or dead? Um, the bookstore? Yeah. The Strand in New York is, it's, I just get, I can get lost in there for a long, long, long time. And it's a cool, cool place. Although I just love the chains too. I love a Barnes and Noble. And, uh, I also, I mean, I, it's, it's like going into a candy store and it's like, I, I want all of them and I'll buy too much of it. And then I will, um, uh, and I'll be frustrated that I can't have all of it. So it's a little like that. <laughs> You're a pretty epic traveler. Like you mentioned North Korea. I think you, I think I heard you say you wrote your very first Wait But Why blog post in Easter Island, if, if I got that right? Yeah, I went to Easter Island for a month to write um, to write a bunch of blog posts when I was about to start Wait But Why with my partner. Right, and I, I remember that famous trip you did that like people picked for you where you were going and it was like Greenland. Yeah, and, that was and, fun. Right, so you're a pretty epic traveler. Do you, when you land in a place or a new city for like say a day or two, is, is visiting a, a bookstore on your list? And if not, like, what do you what do you aim and try to do? It's actually quick, not, and it probably should be. Uh, I, I, bookstores are just cool looking. There's, if you Google bookstore porn, it's unbelievable, gorgeous bookstores all over the world. Um, I need to have the blogger of the biggest site on that on this show. What? I need to have the, whoever's oh the biggest bookstore porn. That's definitely blogger. someone who has a lot to say about bookstores. <laughs> exactly. Sure. Um, yeah, um, when I'm in a new city, I, I, I'm so starstruck by being there. It's just, there's something to me, it, it's, it'll never be the same going to a place I've already been. Then, you know, when I, when I set foot in a new country and I just like, I'm even in the airport, I'm like, wow, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I've always looked at it on the map. I've always heard about it, seen pictures. I'm in this country. To me, there's some part of like my, you know, there's, you know, it's, it talked about how the child and you can be in control. Um, in a bad way, if you have kind of a bad relationship with your stunted child inside of you, but the living children in you can be great. And that little living children continues to delight me when I go to a new country. When I think today's Tim, if you just, I would just say, yeah, whatever, it's a country, there's airports, there's roads. Back then I'm like, you know, I, I, I used to be so in wonder, but and I still have that. And I think it's like really awesome to tap into like the wonder of your inner child if you can. So that, that's an example of, yeah. So if you landed in a city you've never been to before, what do you do? What is this? Wander. Is, well, wander, there's, there's yeah. often a few things on the list you got to see, you know, that are amazing. But uh, for me, wandering, it's like the side of me, which was always out in New York, the side that can just look up and see the building and start to realize how much there is on every block to look at, which usually is just not out in New York. It's out constantly when I travel. I'm just looking at people. I'm looking at the street signs. I'm looking at the, the, the way that the... Um, the cars park and uh, what a grocery store looks like. Yeah, everything. Just ah, love it. And and just looking, walking into random you know stores and you know and so I, I I I'll do that all day sometimes. And you end up in especially if you can combine that with trying to be a little bit outgoing more than you maybe normally are. You'll end up in really cool conversations. People who work in stores or restaurants and yeah. I love stories when people come back from trips and they're just like my friend Joey once came back from a trip. He's like, he's like, what was your favorite thing to do in um, Istanbul? He's like, honestly, I met these guys at like midnight at a bar and I went back and played PlayStation with them all night. Yeah, and it was like you know, at their house. And right. we well, just he probably learned great... a lot more about Istanbul hanging out with those guys than he would have, you know, going to the big mosque there or whatever. You know, totally. Um, uh, do you have a white whale book or a book you've been wanting to read the longest? Infinite Jest. Ah, nice. Okay, that's that's probably w w mine as well. Uh, I think I'm stuck in page 250 or something. Yeah, me too. Um, if you could delete it from your brain, is there a book that you would most want to read again as if it was the first time? Uh, Bill Bryson's Short History of Nearly Everything. Very nice. And my I'm going to read it again anyway. But. Oh, yeah, exactly. Sounds like it. And uh, the very last question, Tim, uh, first of all, before I get to the last question, just a huge thank you. This is a big, um, you've given us a lot of your time, yeah, of your course. energy, your Always wisdom. Always happy to talk uh, to you, Neil. Well, this is just a, a generous uh, gift, and we really appreciate it. I'm so, I was so excited. I was telling Leslie last night how, how excited I was. Um, by the way, I had to. <laughs> It's never a good sentence that begins with, I had a dream about you, <laughs> but, but I woke up this morning and I was like, the vivid thought I had was that you walked off the SNL stage hosting it into this interview for some reason. So I, maybe I, that was I a, wish maybe, I was as cool maybe, as your maybe dream team. Maybe, so maybe that's a is, is foresight. Awesome dude. Yeah. Clearly uh, uh, I'm <laughs> in love with you. Um, but anyway, the last question is, um, is there a piece or two uh, of wisdom or advice you would share to those listening who are aspiring into writing uh, prompt more prominently, whether as an author or um, a blogger. Uh, looking back, yeah. what advice would you give to those people well, wanting to do more? If you can do something 
like the people like. Okay, you know, you might reach some people and they might remember it and come back, but they're not going to like forward it and they're not going to tell everyone about it, right? And that means it's liking something means it's good. But if you can do something that people love that's similar to other things they love, they might find it. And if they do, um, they'll, they'll probably keep listening to it or reading it or whatever it is, watching it. Um, and they might tell people, if you can do something that people love that they don't have, that's not similar to anything they currently love, they will, it'll change their life. They will tell everyone they know and they'll become the biggest evangelist and, and they'll be, and it'll be so sad if you stop doing it. Right. And that's, th those are three different levels. And to me, they're not necessarily, um, every, I think, I really think everyone is, who's, who's, you know, inclined to create something is, is, is pretty much capable of all three levels of those. But the third one is going to take the, the, first of all, the go, doing something people love versus like, it's just going to take a lot more work. Um, it's going to, you know, maybe you're one of these people that can do something really, really great, really quickly. But it's it's just gonna you're gonna have to dig deeper, work harder, right? And 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 obsess over it more. Um, but to do something that's a the third category, something that's really great and it's also original, it's it's this, it's this concept we've been talking about. It's not that you have to be a, a genius original. It's that you have to be willing to kind of invent something from scratch to kind of just picture your thoughts and ideas and talents, like a bunch of raw ingredients on a chef's kitchen and, um, and puzzle them together into something that, um, that eventually works and be ready to make a bunch of bad stuff along the way. And, but when you make something that does work because it's original, the people that love it, they're not going to have anything else like it. And it's going to really be, um, a big deal to them. And, um, and that's, that, that turns into sustainable, work because then people want more and you know and you can so I, I would say just to try to like figure out um what is a good place for you to be in like original scientist experiment or chef mode where's a place you think you can really play in that zone and maybe come up with something and then that's probably a pretty good zone to start playing in but uh, on the other side of that coin you know you shouldn't be a perfectionist and say, you know, everything has to be a magnum opus because so much of the really good, I, be, I believe a lot of like the famous quotes from writers in history probably happened just like typing it out one morning or, you know, a little thought that someone had or as you're going and a lot of them aren't perfectly crafted. It's just you happen to, if you're just kind of producing stuff, you'll find yourself click into a good flow and it can happen anytime. Some people, it happens late at night or in the morning. When you're in a good flow, you might not even realize till after that you were really in it, but like a, a lot of really great stuff just came out of you and you were just in a good zone. And it, it wasn't sitting there obsessing over craving. It's, it's, it's just doing it enough that you allow that flow to kind of kick in. And when it kicks in, you're there creating and stuff is going to now be on the page or on the soundtrack or whatever it is. And uh, so some combo of those things of trying to work hard enough and dig deep enough to do something really good and that's something that's that's not just similar to everything else that's out there. And also on the other side of that coin to um, to not over obsess over it and know that it, 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 the, the good thing will come, you know, it'll, you'll do 12 things quickly and one of them will happen to be great. It's not, you're not gonna sit around and obsess for that 12 times as long uh, to get that one thing to make it great, I think, so yeah. I love that, make things people love that they may not already have. Yes, and there's a huge difference, you know, it's, um, it's, think about, you know, the, the uh, if you want to, the Beatles got so famous because they started creating music that no one had heard before and they loved it and people also loved it. So it's like they weren't just doing, you know, the first few years of the Beatles and they'd still be a famous band because they did, they did something exceptionally well that was already kind of out there. A lot of those Beatles songs sound a lot like catch, another catchy band from the 60s. They were a catchy band in the 60s and then they became truly innovative and they, changed music um, because they started being chefs. They started just playing. And there's a lot of bad Beatles songs. No one knows this. You haven't heard of them. There's a lot of just on, ra on their random albums, you know, the white song album. number seven. Yeah. <laughs> just in their last album. And it's full of in, or, or the early albums have songs you never heard. And these, and this is the songs that made the album. Think of all the other stuff they wrote that never made the album. So they, they just, they were, they, they, they started experimenting very seriously. And, um, and I think that like there's the difference between, you know, you can write the early Beatles stuff or the late Beatles stuff. And the late Beatles stuff is going to make a much bigger splash, but it's going to be also maybe 
it won't catch as easily. You have to kind of, you know, maybe maybe win people over with some of the more obvious stuff and then work your way into a little more originality or, you know, a little bit after maybe you have some people listening. So there's some balance there too. Um, or you just create something new that um, right away, at least it hits enough grooves that people already like that they will, but it, but it is different. Tim, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Hey everybody, it is just me. It is just Neil again. Wow. Thank you so much to the incredible, amazing, brilliant, uh, funny Tim Urban for that for that great conversation. I feel like I could keep listening to Tim all day. I'm sure some of you feel the same way. Um, so many quotes pop out and jump out to me from that chat. Some of them, let's see if they hit any of the ones you you kind of picked out are these are all from Tim. Awake is interesting. Sleeping is boring. <laughs> Sci-fi opens up whole new rooms in your imagination. I love this one. The world around you was built by people no smarter than you. They often were just trying something and it stuck. People started copying it and you can go and change that. If you say just listen, just obey, then you're actually killing kids' confidence as a reasoner. You can't grow if you're not humble. You're not in a position to grow. Non-humble people don't ask questions. They don't self-reflect. They don't reconsider their previous views. They freeze where they are. Art, to me, is just another way to communicate human emotions, human concepts, and human nuances. And I love that whole conversation about art. And finally, since it's a book show, let's finish with a book quote. Bookstores are like candy stores. I want all of them. I buy too much of it. I'm frustrated I can't read them all. I love that. Thank you so much to Tim Irvin for giving us Ur- Urban, not Irvin. Uh, thank you so much to Tim Urban for giving us on our list of the top 1,000. And just as a reminder, if you go to threebooks.co slash the top 1,000, you will see every single book that we've talked about so far on this show, including number 939, The Stinky Cheese Man and Other Fairly Stupid Tales by John Shezka. Number 938, The Boy Who Reversed Himself by William Slater. And number 937, The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand. What a beautiful and magical and wonderful and inspiring conversation between you and me and Tim. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you all on the next Full Moon. And now, if you've made it to this far in the podcast, I'd like to welcome you back to the end of the podcast club. Yes, this is the secret club at the end of the chapter. Actually, it's not the secret club. What am I talking about? This is the well-known and well-understood club. We also have a secret club, but I can't talk more about that. That For that club, you actually have to call our phone number, which is one eight three three read a lot You will be given a clue or a password that is your ticket into joining the 100% analog-only secret club. And no, I'm not joking for any first-time listeners that think I am. We really do have a secret club. But the end of the podcast club isn't the secret club. It just exists at the end of every single podcast is where you talk directly to me. I talk directly to you. We summarize what we what we just learned. And we always start by going to the phones. So let's go to the phones now. Hi, Neil. My name is Erica, and I'm calling this morning from East Tennessee on my way to work. And I just wanted to call and let you know kind of how awesome your podcast is and how it's affected me in my personal life. So as a lover of books, I try to take books and um, apply them to my life, always working on personal growth, right? So, so far, I've listened to all the chapters, um, but so far from your chapter with Seth Godin, I am currently going to adopt the um, See at the Top or the Book of S. I'm not sure which one. I'll be reading one of those, and I'm actually going to implement it into my personal improvement plan that I'm doing at work right now um, because we're in our strategic planning process at work. So um, there's one for my work portfolio. And then um, I also, in my business, I work in population health, and my focus is nutrition and physical activity. So the next book I'm going to read, um, again, from your podcast, is um, the Why We Get Fat and What to Do About It the one that Gretchen uh, suggested. So thank you so much for this podcast because every time I listen, of course, I write down books to read 
but they're not just, oh, this looks like fun. I'm going to read this. These are books that I'm actually going to use to, to maybe make changes in my life, um, in my work life, in my personal life. Um, so thank you. This podcast is awesome, and I appreciate it. And the only way we're going to get better is by listening to and reading from reading reviews like the one that E. Smith left us. So E. Smith, if you are listening, and maybe you're not because you said you weren't going to, but maybe you are because you can't resist. I don't know. If you are listening, drop us a line so we can mail you a free book. So where do we go from here? Well, it is time now for the word of the chapter. This is the time where we always pick out a word that is unique or different or interesting or I don't understand or has an interesting history or whatever that our guest says. So let's go over to Tim now. And by the way, a lot of times you're going to be wrong. There's going to be a molding that was there for a good reason. Uh, you'll do long articles and no one will read them or people will get bogged down. And by the way, I'm still toiling with whether too long is too long. Yes, it is toiling or the root word toil, T-O-I-L. Say it for me, dictionary lady. Toil. Long, strenuous, fatiguing labor. That's what it means. I'm guessing most of you probably knew that. It's a kind of a metaphor for just, or sim simile, metaphor, synonym, for hard work, right? It just means working really hard. Why did I pick that word? Because it has a fascinating origin. That's actually why I picked it. Um, did you know that the word toil comes from the Latin word tudicula, which is T-U-D-I-C-U-L-A? What is a tudicula? Uh, it's a machine for crushing olives. So if you go into a like a Googling rabbit hole like I did, you come up with these gigantic old like machines with like there's there's giant circle rocks and and you can just picture, you know, like uh, over a thousand years ago, uh, someone actually toiling with a tedicula to crush olives and make, you know, olive oil or maybe a fine tapenade. I don't know. Either way. That does sound like very hard work. And if you look up how they made olives and you keep reading about it, like I did, I won't bore you with the details. Sure enough, that's what they were doing when they were toiling. So next time someone says like, oh, I was really toiling through this, you can just picture them uh, kind of slaving away under the hot sun for like weeks to squeeze a whole bunch of olives into olive oil. Uh, good metaphor, probably for what Tim goes through to produce his epic blog posts. And so now here we are at the end of chapter 22 of three books. Um, I am loving this. This has been so much fun. We're only done 22 out of 333 chapters, but it's been great. I mean, Apple's given us the best of 2018 award for podcasts. Uh, we're getting every single chapter that we come out has more and more people kind of listening and downloading and writing to us. Uh, so I feel like we're, we're really making headway here. I feel like the idea of, of reading uh, reading more and reading real books are actually increasing. We read more than ever before now, but we're not reading books as much. We're looking at screens, blah, blah, blah. So so getting back to basics and figuring out the books that really sh shape and change our lives is an important decision for many of us, including me and including you. Thank you for taking that work seriously. Thank you for investing into yourself and into your life. And until next time, just remember that you are what you eat and you are what you read. Take care, and I'll talk to you soon.